Um, so I will go ahead and start. Um, uh, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Professor Alessandro Repici, who is the director of the endoscopy unit in the Humanitas Research Hospital. Uh, uh, Dr. Repici uh, teaches since 2000 gastroenterology and digestive endoscopy at the School of Specialization in Oncology, University of Turin in, in endoscopy diagnostic techniques and operations at the School of Specialization in general surgery one and two at the University of Turin. Um, one of his major accomplishments is the clinical activity and research of Dr. Repici, which turned mainly to the development of new endoscopic techniques in the field of diagnosis and therapy, in particular attention to new methods of endoscopic removal of cancerous lesions and early in the palliation of advanced GI malignancies. He is a member of various national and international scientific society of gastroenterology and digestive endoscopy. Um, I learned a lot from Dr. Repici throughout his um, uh, many, many uh, conferences and, uh, and, uh, and uh, presentations. Today, we are lucky to have him. He's going to talk to us about the application of artificial intelligence and gastroenterology. Dr. Repici, say benvenuto. Oh, thank you so much. So welcome, Lebanon. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alessandro Rebici, and uh, I want to deeply apologize for my disclosures. And uh, of course, some of them, they may have relevance for the topic of the lecture. Artificial intelligence. If you look to these uh, different definitions, they all uh, uh, want to say the same thing, that uh, artificial intelligence basically mirrors the human intelligence, but uh, the power of artificial intelligence is enormously superior to the capability of the human mind. So artificial intelligence replicates human mind actions by is much more precise, powerful, resilient. And doesn't know any fatigue, it works uh, uh, constantly. And um, this is why artificial intelligence has been introduced in many fields of uh, mechanics, electronics, in many areas, many, many things of our um, daily life are controlled by artificial intelligence systems. There's a major problem that exists with having humans be the medical providers human error. No matter how accurate humans are, it is part of being human to make mistakes, which is mind-boggling when you consider how powerful the human brain is. A 2016 study from Johns Hopkins University found that medical errors may be the third leading cause of death, right behind cancer and heart disease, with an estimated quarter million patients dying annually from medical error. So this is why AI for sure can make an impact in medicine, can help us in developing and better um, diagnosis and better treatments for our patients and to avoid as much as possible medical mistakes. So what about artificial intelligence in gastroenterology? This is a, a nice uh, drawing from the article published in GI Endoscopy last year, the proceeding from the first global artificial intelligence in gastroenterology endoscopy summit that has been organized by Pratik Sharma and uh, Mike Wallace on behalf of American Society of Gastroenterology and Endoscopy. There was a long, a, um, very interesting discussion of that summit. Uh, and as you can see here, different area of uh, current application of AI and GI have been discussed. And in conclusion of the meetings, we also have uh, identified uh, some uh, key future needs that will be implemented, will be required to uh, improve adoption of AI in gastroenterology. So this is a little bit of the history of AI in gastroenterology. This is the first paper published five years ago from a Spanish group reporting a machine that was able to improve polyp detection. So basically, uh, there was for the first time 
um, the application of an algorithm to uh, help the physician in detecting polyp to avoid uh, missing polyp into the colon. The application was uh, reported in Gastroenterology 2017 by Michael Byrne and Doug Rex. They were the first to report about uh, a system for characterization of the polyps. So rather than a Spanish group, the first reported about improving detection capability. And these two researchers uh, applied uh, um, an algorithm, a deep learning uh, algorithm to try to predict histology of small polyps they reported first uh, a couple of years ago. Why AI has been used first in the field of a colonoscopy? For many reasons. First, colonoscopy is a life-saving procedure, and we know that for colonoscopy, ADR is the most relevant quality indicator of outcome. But unfortunately, there is still a very high variation, huge variation of adenoma detection rate among physicians, among uh, facilities, medical facilities, uh, with the significant uh, would say significant uh, reduction of the performance in terms of protection of um, our patients from colorectal cancer. Of course, uh, we need to know that the ADR should be as high as 40%. It is a paper published in this month on the Red Journal reporting uh, data from uh, the US based registry QUIC, which is uh, a, um, a program has been adopted several years ago in many American facilities just with the goal to improve the quality of colonoscopy and to register the outcome, especially the ADR. And when you look to this data, the adjusted to US population ADR should be around 40%. So this is uh, uh, extremely important because it tells us that we need to improve our own ADR. And for doing that, probably we need the support of intelligence. Indeed, if you look to the data uh, about uh, ADR, especially in private practice, this is a paper a couple of years ago comparing a tertiary level center, community-based hospital in private practice. You see that in private practice, the ADR is not always uh, above 25% as recommended by international guidelines. In uh, this paper that's been published uh, two years ago in clinical gastro, there has been uh, a report of huge variability among physicians from um, private practice in community practice, with some of them uh, having a very high ADR, as high as 40%, and some others having a very low uh, ADR, which may be unacceptable in terms of prevention of colorectal cancer. Statistically speaking, we know that increasing ADR is important because for each 1% increase in adenoma detection rate, there is a 3% potential decrease in the risk of colorectal cancer. It is another substantial reason why we need to adopt as much as possible all technologies that will help us in improving the ADR of the single physician of the single institution. And we know to go beyond human level performance. So this is the difference between uh, artificial intelligence and the standard endoscopy. So like myself, you may have, you may be tired. Sometimes you may not work perfectly. You may be overwhelmed by external factors. So you make, we make the colonoscopy an operator dependent procedure. And this is not correct. The outcome of colonoscopy should be very stable, super, super stable with a very good ADR regardless of operator, regardless of the timing of colonoscopy, regardless of the uh, level of technology that you're going to use. 
This picture, this slide gives you the feeling on how many companies are working in the space of artificial intelligence. Some of them are already C marked. Fujifilm is the one that's got a C approval for detection system, but also for characterization system. Finally, GIG use from Medtronic is the first that uh, has been FDA approved, so it's currently used in US. This slide shows that also Google is looking in the space of colonos. With this, I think it's a nice witnessing of the fact that there is a huge interest in the field of colonoscopy. We will see more and more new technologies coming also from these tech giants that will try to um, increase the level of performance in colonoscopy using their technologies. How does it work? It works very simply. So you don't need to do uh, big work. It's just implementing a box uh, in your uh, trolley, endoscopy trolley, and that's it. You immediately you can expand your diagnostic field. So um, whatever is the system that you want to use for uh, your unit, uh, doesn't matter, it's very simple, so I encourage everybody to try to adopt the AI at least for a couple of videos showing how AI works. Uh, this is uh, the KDI system for detection. You see, you are not going to miss any polyp. Of course, at this point, it will be your evaluation. You, will, you are still the boss. You have to decide what kind of these polyps uh, are to be resected, how many of them are clinically relevant. You see this is a flat adenomatous polyp. This is a, a pedunculate polyp. Here is also the application of a, a characterization. You see you switch to BLI and quite quickly the system is telling you whether or not the polyp is neoplastic, which means adenomatous, or non-neoplastic, which means hyperplastic. Uh, this is a nice video showing uh, uh, how AI can help you in finding a very difficult polyp. This is the right colon. I was missing this serratus SI lesion, which was uh, pro pro promptly identified by GI Genius. It's nice to show that the AI system, they work under any kind of electronic uh, chrome endoscopy, as well as with the conventional chrome endoscopy. So whatever you are going to use, this will be a great head to your diagnostic. So we, are, we have been the first to do a randomized uh, trial comparing white light versus uh, AI-assisted colonoscopy. The paper was published uh, last year to gastroenterology. We were able to demonstrate a significant increase in adenoma detection rate in the arm of uh, AI-assisted colonoscopy. It's a very important video to me. So it's showing how stable is the system and how the system works despite bubbles. So many people are keep telling me they are concerned about the fact that there may be many false positives during AI, so a lot of activation of the system during colonoscopy. But this is not true. This is a video showing that despite the colon was uh, uh, full of bubbles, there is no activation of the AI system, so it's not giving you any false positive, any noise, and you can keep working very nicely.
And also, the other point of the discussion with the other physician, with the expert in the field, is uh, uh, what is the impact of AI for uh, a physician who are not as expert, expert um, like the uh, top detector, like people like uh, Doug Rex, Cesar Hassan, Evelyn Decker. So we did another randomized trial that is going to be published in GATT. We again randomized patients. Uh, AI versus on AI, the operator were non experts, young and also with the less than 2,000 colonies of COVID in their career. And again, AI was statistically superior to non AI in detecting adenomas, and this was proved in any different uh, location for any morphology of the lesions and for any size of the lesion. So, AI definitely was uh, superior to standard AI also in non expert with non expert endoscopies. Of course, we are just at the beginning of a journey in colonoscopy. There are many things which are coming, especially sizing, quality control. To show this video is a courtesy from uh, uh, our Chinese friends showing how AI can be used to control or to um, evaluate the amount of bowel prep or the quality of bowel prep, as well as AI can be used to monitor the withdrawal speed of the scope uh, during colonoscopy because uh, we know this may be an issue. We don't want people going back from the cecum uh, too quickly, and uh, we don't want these guys missing uh, uh, polyps during the scope withdrawal. So it's important also having a sort of uh, indicator telling you that you're doing well, that you're using the right time to withdraw the scope. And this system will be implemented soon also in clinical practice. So, but of course, there is much more than colonoscopy in gastroenterology, and this is a slide reporting what has been done up to now in the field of AI for gastroenterology. There are data about Barrett, early gastric cancer, H. pylori infection, intestinal metaplasia, capsule endoscopy, and IBD, and much more. So, don't be scared. Uh, in the near future, you will see a lot of papers, a lot of studies reporting about the impact of artificial intelligence in many areas of endoscopy and gastroenterology as well. So, especially this is coming for uh, Barrett. This is a paper that's been recently published in uh, gastroenterology, a deep learning a computer aided system that allows to identify to delineate uh, this plastic lesion in barrier. 
and this is a courtesy of Professor Bandari showing uh, a system, the wise vision that's been already approved in Europe. So you see, Martin, that is extremely good in, detect in detecting mucosal abnormalities in the Barrett esophagus. And I think probably in the next lecture, Professor Bandari will give you. Can tell you that they already have done a first clinical trial that will be presented soon uh, at the SGE meeting and uh, you see sensitivity specificity and accuracy of AI is extremely high much better than precision performances we are working with the Chinese companies also in the field of squamous lesions. Uh, we are collecting video and frames. And you know the system that's been developed and works uh, uh, very nicely because through the heat map you can recognize uh, where, are, where is the squamous uh, dysplasia or cancer. You can not only detect but also delineate the lesion in order to plan therapeutic strategies and uh, according to the preliminary data that we have sensitivity specificity specificity are very high and um, we working uh, either with white light and under uh, uh, electronic chromatoscopy as well uh, and the system uh, looks uh, extremely good uh, under both conditions The last slide is about uh, IBD and AI. This is going to be a new paradigm for scoring disease activities. Also, this paper is uh, uh, published, has been published recently in the gastroenterology system to score IBD severity and that has been developed using full length endoscopy videos from different clinical trials. And uh, you see the work uh, extremely well, it's very stable, and the result has been impressive with uh, um, significant uh, improvement in the performance of scoring the disease activity as compared with the histology. So here the, the control arm was just histology and the eye performed uh, very well. Um, and this is, means that probably in the future we will have this kind of system that will help us in making uh, a very precise scoring of the activity of the disease which will be comparable to the histology. In conclusion, we are just at the beginning of a revolution uh, and in five years uh, AI will be fully implemented in endoscopy. I can beat then in five years there will be no colonoscopy without AI, no body detection without AI. We are at the beginning of the new era. Please remind to get full control of endoscopy procedures yourself. Uh, just uh, look into this uh, article in the Financial Times just always a question whether AI is really more intelligent than you. You are uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Repici, for a very nice uh, presentation on uh, AI. I really learned a lot from you. Um, I have one question for you, uh, and uh, my, my, my question is regarding colonoscopy, and, uh, and uh, how, um, how AI will impact missed polyps and missed lesions in colonoscopy. I still believe that if you really want to do a good colonoscopy, you still have to make sure to uh, turn the patients on every segment, uh, work the folds, make sure your preparation is clean. Um, so I think these are still very, very important factors uh, in, in colonoscopy and in polyp and uh, lesion detection. Uh, with AI, you really have to be on the lesion in order for you to detect it. So uh, how do you think AI will um, uh, impact missed polyps and missed lesions? And is this the final answer? 
So you're totally right. I think there are so many things uh, before AI that needs to be implemented in our practice, including power prep. All of you say it is uh, correct. But of course, uh, AI is um, an additional tool that we need to use because the performance of AI is stable over time. So you may be tired in the afternoon or you may be distracted. Sometimes we focus on the specific area of the boss, but the quality is on the other side. So AI is a sort of an angel driving you and helping you to avoid missing rate. So there is already a paper published recently by a combination of physicians from China and the US. And they already reported that AI is very important also in reducing the adenoma miss rate. I think there are also data coming from the US with the GI genius. Uh, it's a multi center study that has been recently completed. Data is not available yet. I had to look to the data, but my feeling is that AI has been superior to the physician in reducing adenoma miss rate. So, uh, of course, colonoscopy issues are all important from uh, um, the level of expertise of the physician to the power prep to the fact that you have to. Uh, fully expose the entire mucosal surface, but um, that the power of AI, the strength of AI is much higher than anything else. Uh, I thank you for this answer. And, and the message that uh, Dr. Re uh, Professor Repici wants to bring here is that AI is only part of the pie in ADR and, and lesion detection. It's one of the, uh, one of the tools that we use uh, everything, all the others that we that we use to increase ADR are still very, very uh, important. And I think this is a very important message to trainees, uh, to young doctors that are just starting to practice. Thank you very much for this answer. Uh, Thank you. George, <laughs> Professor Repice, if I may, uh, Fadi Daniel, another moderator. Uh, uh, thank you for the insightful lecture. Uh, the question that begs an answer, I believe, uh, uh, being an academic gastroenterologist and being involved on an everyday basis in the uh, training of GI fellows. How do you see in the near future uh, AI will impact the training of GI fellows? I mean, you will be publishing soon the expert, non-expert data, which clearly shows a big benefit. But when it, when it comes to the really the GI fellows who doesn't know so far the, how, how to handle the scope, how to handle the falls, the, how to, to handle the flexures. So if you had it in a GI, an academic setting, would you introduce the GI upfront in the first year for the GI fellow training, or would you leave it till the, when once the, the fellows has acquired the basic skills to, of intubation and withdrawal and so forth? So can you please comment on this? Yeah, this is a very important topic, I don't know that answer, because it's, uh, we are at the very early stage. So we're doing a study with the fellow on histology prediction. And what we observed with the fellows, that um, fellows become more um, secure when they have the assistance, the assistance uh, of AI. So I'm not sure uh, what is the right time to implement uh, AI in the Probably in the early step, in the beginning, as you say, when they need to um, learn how to manage the scope, how to make the most important maneuvers during chronoscopy. Probably they should be, they need to be fully trained with the eye system. Also, because you know, this is what I said during my presentation in five years, I do not believe that there will be a single uh, facility without the eye. So, the eye is going to be. A part of uh, endoscopy, especially of colonoscopy, for each colonoscopy, I think also in the reporting of what we're doing, uh, we will write that uh, the system uh, is helping us in uh, doing colonoscopy. So I think we need to fully train all our fellows with the AI system as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thank you. Very important question. Any any questions from the from the audience at all? Uh, Fadi, do you see any questions there? So far, no. So far, I haven't any. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, I want to thank Dr. Repici for presenting this very important topic and uh, uh, another tool to help us in uh, lesion detection. Um, I think uh, we're probably ready to move, Fadi, to uh, 
Professor Pradeep Bandari. Yes, uh, so with that, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Pradeep Bandari, uh, very, well to know, uh, very well known to you. Uh, it's not his first uh, lecture in the Lebanese uh, arena. Professor Bandari uh, is a professor of gastroenterology since 2012. Uh, he leads an advanced endoscopy service at Portsmouth Hospitals Universities. NHS Trust, and he is the chair of the research committee of the European Society of Giant Endoscopy. So he's going to be tackling the uh, issue of real-time biopsies and the importance of, and for, of it in the future. Professor Bendardi, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning, guys. Uh, uh, I'm really delighted to join you. It's a real shame that I couldn't be there in person. Uh, hopefully, next time, I will make sure that I'm there in person. So thanks Zahir and thanks all the organizers uh, for organizing such a nice meeting. Uh, <clears throat> Professor Rapici has already talked about where this field is going and where it will be in five years time. I'm going to talk about where we have been and what is the basis of development of AI. So this is how AI has been developed based on the human intelligence and everything that we have uh, acquired over the years. So where I will go through the, the concept of uh, moving from biopsy to optical diagnosis related to polyps, colitis, Barrett, squamous, and gastric neoplasia. Uh, the first thing that we learned was the morphology gives us a lot of idea. So once you understand the Paris morphology carefully, we begin to recognize the risk related to each neoplasia that we find. Uh, here you can see the data that if you have 2C uh, morphology, the risk of cancer in any lesion in the gut is very high, but this data is specifically related to colonic polyps. So that's the starting point, which is very easy for most endoscopists to recognize. Another important factor for morphology two different types of polyps. This is LST granular type, which has big nodules. The risk of cancer is lower than LST non-granular type on the right side, which is very flat and the risk of cancer is very high. Also, biopsies. The impact of biopsies here is, if you biopsy the nodule, you might be able to pick up the cancer here. If you biopsy the flat component, unlikely to pick up the cancer here. So it's very important for people who want to biopsy is where to biopsy. However, on the other side, if you have a non-granular LST, they have multifocal cancers. So taking a biopsy here is not going to help much. You might find, you might not find cancer. So if you see this kind of morphology, I believe biopsy doesn't play much of a role. It is an endoscopic assessment and deciding whether there are skills available to remove it by ESD or not. Or if it's going for surgery, then it doesn't really matter. The concept of optical diagnosis started with this uh, landmark development from Professor Kudo's group who described the pit patterns of polyps. And I won't go through the details of it, but they showed us that uh, if you understand the pit patterns in the polyp, then you can make a very confident diagnosis with a sensitivity between 90 to 98% and a very high specificity as well. Uh, subsequently, these classifications have been simplified and this is the Western version called NICE classification using NBI, where we can differentiate a hyperplastic polyp from adenoma from an invasive cancer. This same classification uh, again showed very high sensitivity on picture-based studies with, in expert setting. Uh, so again, it shows that you can make a very high level optical diagnosis without the need for biopsies. Uh, the, the NICE classification was fine tuned and modified to make it more uh, specific to the practice by our Japanese colleagues. And they called it a JNET classification where they subdivided type two, the adenoma into 2A and 2B and 2B basically reflects high-grade dysplasia in an adenoma or SM1 type of invasive cancer. 
So this 2B is endoscopically resectable and curable. And then they separated the cancer is this type three as the deep invasive cancer, which is not endoscopically resectable. So if you master this, you can make these decisions without the help of biopsies. If you're using BLI, then you can use the basic classification which you published a few years ago. Uh, again, it's a very simple classification which looks at the surface, as I said to you before, is important. The pits and the vessels, and based on this, you can differentiate adenomas which look like this versus hyperplastic polyp versus sessile serrated adenomas or sessile serrated polyps because the drawback of NICE classification and JNET classification is that they don't allow for diagnosis of sessile serrated polyps, but BASIC will help you do that, uh, as well as cancers. Now we use the BASIC classification to see if it really helps or not. So we had uh, a bunch of expert, very experienced uh, gastroenterologists in uh, across Europe and we tested them, uh, their accuracy and sensitivity in terms of making an in vivo diagnosis of polyps. And we found that the best they could achieve without training was about 80% sensitivity uh, with an 80% negative predictive value for adenomas. So again, uh, and that is, that is, I think the baseline standard most experienced endoscopists would have. Then we conducted a very dedicated training program for these experienced consultants uh, with the basic classification. And we found that, look at that, the sensitivity shot up to 97%. Similarly, negative predictive value shot up to 97%. So a dedicated training program and a dedicated classification improves the performance of experienced gastroenterologists in making in vivo diagnosis. Uh, their confidence in making an in vivo diagnosis also went up. And I know earlier on you were asking uh, uh, Professor Apici about the impact of AI. I think that will be the one of the biggest thing AI will do is we can already make optical diagnosis of lesions we see, but if we have AI in conjunction with that, our confidence in making the diagnosis will go up. What about the fellows? Well, we tested our fellows and they performed slightly inferior to experienced consultants in making in vivo diagnosis without training. But when we did a dedicated session of training with the fellows, they were performing at the same level as the experienced consultants. So with training and adequate cl and proper classifications, we can improve the performance of fellows to the same level as our experienced colleagues. Uh, now, this is a patient who had a EMR, comes back for surveillance, and you can see that on white light, it's not very clear what's going on, whether it's scar or an adenoma. You put BLI, and it becomes obvious that in the middle, there is a scar, and then on the left side, there is a residual adenoma. You magnify a tiny bit, and you can see that this is the residual adenoma, and this is what you need to remove or biopsy because if you take the biopsy from the scar, you will think there is no residual adenoma, no recurrence. So again, this shows that the technology is already there. But when we do the real world studies uh, of optical diagnosis, this is one of the largest studies in UK where uh, about, uh, uh, it's called Discard 2, where about six big hospitals, 28 endoscopists, who were trained in NICE classification uh, uh, prospectively made optical polyps in 722 patients, about 1,500 plus polyps, uh, and their accuracy was only 83% with a sensitivity of 73% for diagnosis of adenoma. So this is way below what is expected to make the right decision for the patient. So in real world, we feel that the technology did not deliver for us despite training. Uh, what about colitis? Uh, this is a paper just come out this month in gut. Uh, we did a randomized trial, a multicenter study, comparing white light endoscopy, targeted biopsies with white light endoscopy, high definition white light versus image enhanced endoscopy with eye scan 
And what we found that uh, even why high definition white light targeted biopsies are more than enough to detect all the neoplasia and colitis. So we're trying to move the algorithm, which was random well, protocol guided quadrantic biopsies. Then we moved on to dye spray. Then people started talking about NBI and image enhanced endoscopy. What we're now reporting is if you have high definition white light and adequate skills, just targeted biopsies with white, white light is more than enough to detect all the neoplasia and colitic biopsies. Here you can see that the non-targeted, we also conducted uh, quadrantic biopsies in these patients at the same time. And there was only one additional neoplasia that was detected uh, with, with the uh, quadrantic biopsies in these 188 patients. So it's a cost comes almost at the cost of 7,000 biopsies to detect one additional neoplasia. So the conclusion is the high definition white light targeted biopsies will be more than enough for colitis in the future. How about Barrett's? Uh, this is a patient with a very long segment of Barrett's. You can see on white light, uh, there's nothing much wrong with this Barrett's. Looks very nice, but he was referred to us because random biopsies should raise the possibility of neoplasia and they had two further endoscopies and they couldn't find. So we're using BLI from Fujifilm here and we see a small area here, which doesn't look right, slightly raised. The pit patterns are, and the vessel patterns are slightly different. So you use a magnification and you can see that the vessels are dilated. They're a little bit tortuous. You can see this is the demarcation line, neoplasia on the right side. Uh, we can use uh, acetic acid on top of that. You can see there's a loss of acetovitamin. Uh, here is the neoplasia. And now you use BLI, it becomes even more clear where the lesion is. We have recently published uh, this uh, very well-validated classification for using BLI in uh, Barrett's. This is called blink classification, which has a very high sensitivity and negative predictive value. Uh, basically use three different factors. And I con don't consider this as classification. I consider this is a way of assessing Barrett's with BLI. So first you look at the color. If you see focal darkness anywhere with BLI, you should, it should raise the suspicion of neoplasia. Then you look at pits and you look at the type of pits, the distribution of the pits and density. So if the pits, are amorphous, but they can also be completely normal in neoplasia. But if the distribution is irregular, that should raise the suspicion. And also in neoplasia, the density of pits become uh, is high. So the pits are very compactly packed. When, then you move on to the vessels and look at the same thing about the type of vessels. They can be dilated or branching or non-cryptal. When you see non-cryptal vessels, that's an indication of an invasive neoplasia, especially if there is a focal loss or increase in density. So again, a very good way of assessing Barrett's with BLI, uh, which is very well proven. You can see in this example, a patient with Barrett neoplasia who was referred to us because endoscopist first biopsy showed uh, possible indeterminate neoplasia. Second biopsy showed high grade. So they sent this patient to us for EMR. Uh, we are assessing with a uh, has Alexio system here and using BLI and bit of magnification, you can see that the surface, the vessels are lost. Uh, it's dark, lost vessels, lost pits. That's normal in the distance there. That's a demarcation line. And as we move back, you see all these dilated tumor vessels uh, with loss of pits uh, and amorphous areas there. This is clearly a deep invasive cancer where the EMR is not the right treatment. So again, no need of biopsy. Biopsy actually misguided the clinician. That's why I feel that the optical diagnosis and skills are very important and don't go just with biopsies. If you don't want to do complex things, you can use acetovitamin times. So use acetic acid. Uh, uh, when you spray acetic acid in Barrett's, it uh, neoplasia loses the acetovitamin very quickly 
And the time with which it loses its acetovitening and becomes red gives you an idea of the pathology. If it is non-neoplastic, then it stays white for a very long time. Here you can see if it's high-grade dysplasia, it loses its whitening under a minute. And if it is a cancer, then it loses whitening within about 20 seconds. So this is one of our uh, really important piece of work a while ago we published. Uh, and I feel this is a very easy technique for most clinicians to master and they can make a very good diagnosis. Uh, here you can see it in action. Uh, we, there's a nodule and a flat area. Flat area was not visible on white light. We spray acetic acid, everything has gone white and you will see right in the middle, already the whitening is lost because there's a focus of cancer in the middle of this nodule. And as you wait a little bit longer, here you can see the surrounding flat area is now going red. That's high grade dysplasia. Uh, but again, look at the surrounding Barrett's, normal Barrett's remains white. Now everything slowly has gone red uh, because this is high grade dysplasia in the middle which lost its whitening later. Cancer right in the middle in the nodule which lost immediately. So that gives you an idea of the pathology as well. We recently published this acetic acid classification, again, very well validated classification in gut based on only two factors, surface pattern and loss of aceto whitening. With these two factors, you can have a sensitivity uh, and negative predictive value above 90%. So again, no need for biopsies almost uh, if you use this classification properly. Uh, this is just an example of other technologies like uh, white light doesn't show the Barrett's neoplasia, but LCI shows you a red spot with a pink background, raising a suspicion something is going on. You assess it with BLI, but then you can combine uh, acetic acid and LCI. Look at that. It beautifully demarcates the entire neoplasia and rest of the acetic acid is white. Squamous neoplasia, well, there are these IPCL patterns described by Professor Inoue. If you master them, this is the normal IPCL pattern, and these are the neoplastic IPCL pattern. From left to right, it's getting worse, uh, more and more invasive, uh, and this can again help you make a very good optical diagnosis without the need for biopsies. More recently, Japanese society has simplified this classification making it very easy for us to use in clinical practice. Finally, gastric cancer. I show these slides always uh, because I feel it's a very powerful message. This is a well-differentiated adenocarcinoma of the stomach. The reason we say that uh, it is intramucosal because it's a distal lesion. That's where uh, well-differentiated cancers appear. It's reddish in color. That's again what is a sign of a well differentiated cancer. They are on a background of atrophic gastritis. You can see there's atrophic gastritis around, and they're generally raised. So these are very simple morphological, very simple pathological facts. If you know these, then you can make a diagnosis as good, or I would say even better than pathologists uh, without the need for biopsies. This is a signet ring type of gastric cancer. Uh, why do I say it's signet ring type of gastric cancer? Because it is a cancer in the upper third of the stomach. It's very flat or depressed. It's very pale and there's no atrophic gastritis. These are the simple facts which will help you make the diagnosis without the need for biopsy that this is a signet ring type of cancer. You can use NBI now, at least in UK, British Society of Gastroenterology recommends a surveillance for intestinal metaplasia in stomach and recommends a lot of biopsies. But I think again, we can supplement or target our biopsies by using NBI, looking for this light blue crest around the crypts, which helps us target the biopsies to pick up the intestinal metaplasia in stomach. So in conclusion, I think optical diagnosis does require our very good understanding of classifications. It does require experience and training and requires modern endoscopes. I've shown you that in the expert world, it is very well proven 
that experts can perform optical diagnosis without the biopsies as good or even better than pathologists. Uh, but unfortunately, even in the expert world, the practice has not been implemented. Even experts don't use it in practice outside of research setting. However, when we implement this in real world, when we test the real world, we find that optical diagnosis still doesn't work. So, which is a sad scenario. And that's why we need to look at the future. And I think the future is going to be a combination of human plus AI. It's not human versus AI, human plus AI. And hopefully we can use AI with our own intelligence. So the real intelligence from humans and artificial intelligence from the computers, both will work together. And I think will make the pathologist redundant in the future. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Professor Bandari, for this uh, enjoyable lecture as usual. Uh, I really enjoyed your conclusion uh, when it comes uh, to human plus AI, because uh, allow me to be the devil's advocate. Uh, if someone looks at the whole published, the whole wealth of uh, published literature, when the, with the start of uh, optical biopsies, be it with the eye scan, with, with the FICE, uh, or different system, and after a big deal of publication, it proved that they do not add a lot when it comes to adenoma detection rate. And, remained the, 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 the part of the chrome endoscopy for neoplasia detection in IBD. It was put in the guidelines and in, afterwards in your virtuoso trial, it, it really, it, it went away, completely went away. At least it's gonna have a big impact on the next guidelines in IBD, uh, endoscopic surveillance of neoplasia. So that is to lead us that then came the Fuji with the BLE, which was the only uh, available system that shows that optical uh, biopsies do, do give a plus when it comes to only high definition, high definition white light endoscopy. So uh, the, the, the simple question is the following. If you, are, if you were practicing in a developing country such as I do, and you had the choice of investing in this uh, uh, optical uh, in biopsy system, such as BLE, or investing in AI. So I believe your, your answer could, would be more invest in AI and drop all the optical and the chromo endoscopy. So just a provocative uh, question. Uh, it is a provocative question. I think uh, uh, it's good. That's why we have these meetings so that we can have provocative discussions. Uh, I don't think there is a, a comparison between this and that. I think everything works in combination. The way AI world is going, if you look at the development of AI, if AI is being developed by an endoscope manufacturer like uh, Fujifilm, Olympus, or Pentax, they are developing AI in conjunction with their own patented technology. So uh, Olympus AI for characterization only works on NBI. Fuji's AI for characterization only works on BLI. And again, Pentax AI for characterization is developed for eye scan. None of them work on white light. If you look at independent providers like Wise Vision that Professor Apichi showed, we working with a Japanese company, NEC, which is an independent provider, doesn't make endoscope. So they have focused their effort only on white light. So that is a cross-platform technology which will work on every single endoscopy platform that you have, only on white light, doesn't need patented technology. So I don't think we need to copy human practice when we do AI. And that's where I think the thought process went wrong and partly conflicted by commercial interests of the companies that we copying our practice with AI. There's no need to do that. We don't need NBI, BLI for making in vivo diagnosis. AI can make it on white light. And I, you will see that transition in the future. So I'm not saying you should not invest in advanced endoscope because you do need very high definition white light and you do need uh, NBI and BLI for other things, but AI will work without them. So future is still need an advanced endoscope and AI definitely will work on that. I hope that I answered your question without conflicting much. 
Uh, allow, allow me allow me another provocative question in the same yeah. line of thinking so uh, correct me if i'm wrong if i got you if i wanted to invest i'm a third developing world uh, or third or developing country and i it's it's better for me to not to invest in any of the three major companies uh, be it uh, fuji be it olympus be it pentax because everyone is developing its proper ai corresponding to its proper optical uh, chromo endoscopy system so more invest in someone who is developing ai for high definition white light, white light endoscopy is this correct or not uh, man if you i answer this question all the sponsors will walk away from this uh, meeting and zahir is everyone over, over, over my back i know that i take full responsibility you don't have to take full responsibility i provoked you but i i need an answer uh, well okay uh, the uh, I think um, there, there are, uh, it's a very, very important point. Uh, it just shows how developments happen in medical field and why they go in one direction. Because for all these scientific developments, you need funding. And the initial work always happens with commercial fundings. And once a commercial funding starts a line of development, you have pilot data already and people like us can then get bigger grants to then develop from that pilot data. So the trajectory is set by that commercial uh, interest that starts that kind of development. So it's all on us to think laterally. If we can think laterally and we are proven with system like Wise Vision that AI works very well on white light, works across the platforms, you don't need to uh, copy your practice. So I'm sure this will be realized in the future. And if you are going to invest, if the money is limited and you have different generations of endoscopes and different kinds of platforms in your unit and you can't equip every single room, then buy a mobile AI platform which can go from one room to the other and work across all the platforms. And these kind of AI systems are now being available. And as uh, uh, Professor Rapici highlighted, that the only CE mark device right now for polyp detection, polyp characterization, and barracks is from Wise Vision from NEC, uh, which works across all platforms. And similar platforms will come more and more. Uh, so it's up to us. But again, on the other side, it's about convenience. If you are a pure Olympus unit, and if you have the money, you will equip with Olympus because it doesn't matter to you whether it works in white light or NBI, it works. Uh, and you have Olympus, you're not gonna change. You might as well use that. Similarly, people using Fuji will think, well, I'm only gonna use Fuji. So I might as well just invest and get CADI in every room. So it's all about finances and uh, what exactly is in your unit. Based on that, I think decisions will be made. Thank you, thank you. I made sure that our endoscopy director is listening for the advice. George, do you have any other questions? Yes, I do. Pradeep, thank you again for a very enlightening lecture. I learned a lot again from you. Um, I have just one question. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in training. Uh, you presented two uh, scenarios in your presentation. One regarding the export world and one the real world. And I believe uh, one of the slides you showed a significant improvement uh, post-training. Uh, this is what I'm interested in. How can we adopt this in Lebanon as a training course? Where should we start? Uh, what do you suggest? Uh, give us some uh, advice uh, and, and I'm having, I hope uh, the, uh, our, uh, um, you know, uh, our president uh, of the LHGE uh, and the committee at the LHGE would be listening to this because I think this is important for us. I think uh, that's a very important and relevant point. Uh, this has been the desire for every single country and every single uh, of professional societies to introduce these. Uh, and we've been struggling uh, everywhere, but slowly, at least in UK, we have seen that by adopting uh, the pit pattern classifications to start with and subsequently the other classification within the bowel cancer screening program, 
we have programmed most of our endoscopists now to commit to making an optical diagnosis. Uh, and slowly their performance is improving. We've now reached these crossroads where AI is coming and making the optical diagnosis as well. So people are beginning to think whether optical diagnosis made by human is still relevant or not. But having spent three years in developing AI, I know the ultimate decision will still be made by the doctor. So you, even when AI becomes very good, there will still be technical glitches and all kinds of issues where AI will go wrong and doctor will have to supersede the AI call. So it still remains relevant that we train our next generation in very good optical diagnosis skills so that they can use AI efficiently. How do we do that? I think everyone should be taught the classification which is made mandatory, but single episodes of teaching and training do not last, George. They need to be repeated periodically, they need to be practiced, and they need to be audited. So right. it has to come from inside. You have to put in the effort that today I've attended this lecture, I've learned, I'll go tomorrow, next four weeks, I will make a diagnosis, I will collect the histology of all my polyps and I'll correlate it to my own diagnosis. And we are doing a trial like that, we'll show you data soon, where we found that with time, when we look at our own mistakes, if you have your pictures available and you compare when you went wrong and look at the picture, with time endoscopies get better and better. And within six months, they become really, really good if you do this self-teaching self exercise, which is about making a call, collecting the pictures, getting the histology back and correlating it to your picture, and then understanding why I went wrong with the help of experts. I think that's the way to do. I can talk to you outside of this platform later, George, how are we doing this? And maybe sure. you can implement that. Yes, that would be great. I'd really be interested in this. And maybe I can present that to the committee of the LSG and we can uh, start a, uh, uh, something with that. Thank you very much, Pretty Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor Bandari. And for the sake of time, we're going to be ending this session. Thanks a lot. Very enjoyable lecture. Hope to see you soon next year. Definitely. Yeah. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Hello, the opening ceremony. Well Live? Symposium. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, in fact. Uh, allow me to, uh, first of all, let me thank the organizing committee for, for the invitation. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation uh, before. Uh, allow me to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Cecilio Azar, who will be talking about the optimal treatment strategy for the extra-intestinal manifestations in IBD. Uh, Dr. Cecilio, uh, a renowned national and regional GI a gastroenterologist with more than 15 years of experience, special areas of expertise, uh, IBD and hepatology, uh, several publications in multiple journals and uh, books. Uh, as well, uh, an exceptional uh, lecturer with uh, him being on advisory boards of multiple uh, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, he has a high, he is highly skilled in upper GI and lower GI as well, uh, endoscopies as well as intragastric balloons. Uh, he's involved in teaching medical students, residents and fellows, and as well a member in multiple international societies such as the ESGE and uh, ECHO members. Uh, Cecilio, the, the floor is yours. Nice seeing you, although uh, over the screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Saeed, for this lovely introduction. And it's a great pleasure to see you all guys again, honestly, after such a long, uh, long, uh, long awaited uh, uh, encounter. And I want to thank also the organizers, Abvi, for asking me to give this lecture. And I want to congratulate, of course, uh, Zahir for keeping up this medical education despite all the uh, turmoils going on in Lebanon. So I'll share my slides now. Uh, voila. Um, let me see. All right. So my, my topic is to talk about extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. 
these are my disclaimers. Uh, uh, and uh, the objective of my lecture is to highlight the extra intestinal manifestations of IBD and describe how clinically they present with or without IBD and to discuss the management. We always talk about how to manage patients with IBD, the treatment, we aim to try to put them in clinical remission. However, we tend to sometimes forget about a very important factor in IBD, which are the extra intestinal manifestations. So I'll give you briefly, you all need, you all of course know about it, and I don't need to uh, repeat this. Uh, Crohn's disease is an immune mediated chronic inflammatory disease, and there are two main uh, 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 two main topics, they are the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and we should not forget the indeterminate colitis. We all know the difference between the two. Uh, Crohn's disease, you know, we have deep transmural involvement, while ulcerative colitis, we only have superficial continuous involvement. Um, rectal sparing in Crohn's disease, while uh, rectum is always involved in ulcerative colitis. Uh, there are fistulizations of gynomas in Crohn's disease, less, less likely in ulcerative colitis. 50% of patients with Crohn's actually underwent appendectomy, and this is not the case in ulcerative colitis. And uh, it gets worse, Crohn's gets worse with smoking. Uh, however, it gets better with an ulcerative colitis, but definitely we should not be telling our patients to smoke. Um, we have to always uh, ask ourselves, what are the extra intestinal symptoms? Now, they are divided into major categories. First of all, the extra intestinal complications. Now, these are uh, uh, related to uh, disease itself. For example, micronutrient deficiencies, osteoporosis, nephrolithiasis, and uh, uh, side effects of drugs. However, the, our topic today is going to be about extra intestinal manifestations that actually happen in uh, uh, one fourth of patients with IBD, and some data shows that it could reach up to 50%. Now, these are inflammation outside the intestine. They can be dependent on the disease itself, uh, uh, activity of the IBD itself, or it can be independent. Now, there are some that are related to bowel activities, such as episcleritis, erythematodosum, oral aftos ulcers, and palsy arthritis. And there are some that are unrelated to bowel activity. You might have a quiescent IBD, However, you have an extra intestinal manifestation such as ankylosing spondylitis, uveitis, pyoderma gangrenosum, and PSC. Now, these are just some of the uh, extra intestinal manifestations that are encountered in IBD. The most common definitely are uh, uh, bone musculoskeletal disease and skin diseases. Less, uh, to, uh, to a lesser extent, the, fortunately, to a lesser extent, the involvement of the eye, such as epistleritis and uveitis. Uh, and we have some rarer diseases, fortunately, such as pyoderma gangrenosum. Now, briefly, we'll talk about each one. These are simply, uh, this is a, a, a table that I did um, comparing what are the extra intestinal manifestations and the estimated frequency. For example, the most common are the uh, uh, peripheral arthropathy, such as arthritis, axial weather, or sacroiliitis. It can reach up to 25% of patients, uh, more so in Crohn's disease. There are some skin diseases such as erythema nodosum. It can happen up to 15% of patients with IBD. To a less extent, pyoderma gangrenosum and sweet syndrome. And we have oral aftos ulcers. We have a lot, a lot of patients that present to our clinic with recurrent aftos ulcers. So every time we have a refracted oral aftos ulcers, it's worthwhile checking for inflammatory bowel disease. Now, ocular manifestations are less common than the musculoskeletal and skin disease. For example, episcleritis and uveitis depends whether it's Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. And let's not forget the hepatobiliary manifestations such as primary sclerosis and cholangiopathies. Sorry, something's going on. All right. So as I mentioned earlier in the talk, there are things that, that are some uh, extra intestinal manifestations that parallel the disease course, and some are not that do not correlate with the disease course. For example, uh, peripheral arthropathy, uh, uh, oral aftos ulcers, and episcleritis, these are parallel to the uh, uh, intestinal inflammation. So if you treat the intestinal inflammation, these will actually uh, subside. However, there are, for example, axial arthropathy or peripheral arthropathy, and pyoderma gangrenosum, and uveitis sometimes, and uh, uh, PSC, sometimes they are unrelated to the activity itself. 
Now, this is the first uh, and actually the last uh, and the only one uh, ECHO guideline concern, consensus on extraintestinal manifestations. And they stated that up to 50% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease actually experience at least one extraintestinal manifestation during their life, uh, lifetime. So this is a very high number, actually, and we should always try to try to ask our patients and give our uh, investigations towards also not only intestinal but also extra intestinal manifestations. And the involvement of extra intestinal manifestations, uh, most of the time, it is after the diagnosis in seventy five percent of cases of extra intestinal manifestations. However, in twenty five percent of patients, it can actually be presenting manifestations of IBD. For example, a lot of patients come with oral aftus ulcers. Sometimes we get referrals from dermatologists for erythema, refractory erythema nodosum. So it this could be a primary presentation. So extra intestinal manifestation can be the primary pre pre manifestations of IBD. Now, this is a slide that is really important and I want to shed the light on this because these are very high numbers and we need to keep this in mind. For example, patients with, patients with uh, uh, psoriasis, up to 60% of these patients have an underlying occult inflammation. Same thing goes for psoriasis. Up to 50% of cases have a subclinical inflammatory disorder. And vice versa, patients with IBD, up to 39% actually have some sort of an arthropathy, and up to 47%, 47% actually have extra intestinal manifest skin manifestations. So these are numbers that are not not to be taken lightly. So all the time we need to ask for back pains, arthropathies, visual disturbances, whether skin manifestations, because these are very common. So simply we can collaborate with our uh, uh, colleagues, uh, the rheumatologists and dermatologists, and to ask them simply any patient who has psoriasis or rheumatological disease, simply ask for fecal calprotectin and CRP. And if, if it's positive, then refer to gastroenterologist for diagnosis of IBD. Definitely, we all know the main role play and the playmaker of uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and extra intestinal manifestations is TNF alpha. And it definitely, it can be present in different sites skin, joints, and intestine. It, it's overexpressed in these sites. So, this is the main driver of inflammation, not just inside the bowels, but also outside the bowels. I'm going to run quickly over the most common. Uh, first of all, dermatological manifestations, the most common, of course, is uh, erythema nodosum. Uh, mostly it's in Crohn's disease rather than ulcerative colitis, and this sometimes parallels the disease activity. It's mostly on extensive surfaces, and it's important to um, uh, advise our patients with IBD to avoid sun exposure. They need to be checked yearly by a dermatologist and to apply sunscreen because these patients are very well known to have a higher chance of uh, uh, skin cancers, non melanoma skin cancers and melanoma. This is why we need to always do a skin check on yearly basis. To a lesser extent, the pyoderma gangrenosum, maximum 2% of cases can present, uh, specifically with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, most uh, in Crohn's disease. Uh, they, these are destructive lesions. Fortunately, we don't see that very often. And there are other skin lesions such as psoriasis, metastatic Crohn's disease and sweet syndrome. Musculoskeletal is definitely one of the most common uh, encounter of extraintestinal manifestations, mostly peripheral arthropathies in 15% of cases, same ratio, male to, if, female to male ratio. And these are non-erosive and non-deforming and mostly attacks the large joints. The spondylitis also can uh, present in quarter of patients and sacroiliitis also. So it's always important, as I mentioned earlier, any patient with inflammatory bowel disease should be asked for morning stiffness, for back pains, for joint pains, anything that has to do with uh, uh, musculoskeletal diseases should be asked for. Fortunately, less common than skin and uh, musculoskeletal diseases, these are the ocular manifestations, that these are emergencies and, need to, and they need to be treated uh, ASAP. In some of the uh, 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 publications, they can they mention that it can affect up to 43% of IDD, IBD patients, uh, and it's most commonly involving the anterior chamber, the epistleritis. Posterior chambers are less likely. There is a more female predominant, and in 75% of cases, they are associated with arthritis. So these are multiple extraintestinal manifestations, and this is an, it requires immediate and emergent evaluation. And again. All patients with IBD, they need to have an annual uh, ophthalmological checkup. Always, we should not forget about blood diseases. They are high, uh, IBD, you all know that they are hypercoagulable state in up to 6% uh, 6 of patients. 
and mostly it parallels inflammation. That's why any patient with a flare-up of IBD admitted to the hospital, we should always give them low molecular weight heparin. It's multifactorial. We have a factor five latent deficiency, thrombocytosis, and hyperhomocysteinema. And always let's not forget the deficiencies of vitamins and minerals. Hepatobiliary complication, of course, it's something that we always look for in patients with IBD. PSC is not very common in 2% of patients with ulcerative colitis. However, patients with PSC in 90% of cases, they have ulcerative colitis. These patients should always be monitored carefully and followed up on a yearly basis for cholangiocarcinoma. And again, very high prevalence of gallstones in these patients. So anytime a patient with IBD presents with fever, disturbed liver enzymes, and right upper quadrant pain, we should always look for uh, gallstone diseases. After stomatitis, by far, it's an extremely common encounter in IBD. It is variable. We sometimes give them treatment empirically. But again, always we need to look for mineral deficiencies, such as zinc, vitamin D, and folate deficiency, deficiencies. And we should always look for IBD in patients with refractory of the stomatitis or after ulcers. Again, renal manifestations. A lot of these patients, up to 10%, have nephrolithiasis, uh, most common for hyperoxaluria. We treat them regularly as regular uh, uh, kidney stones. We always have to treat IBD because sometimes inflammation in the ileum and in the colon can, can have an obstructive uropathy from extrinsic compression. And we always need to ask our patients about the urea and recurrent renal infection because there's a high chances, in, specifically in patients with Crohn's disease, they have, have a fistula, intervesicular fistula. So this is also one of the complications and extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. Again, we tend to forget about bone diseases, diseases uh, not just related to IBD itself, but also related to the drugs that we use in IBD, such as steroids, methotrexate, and cyclosporin. And it's advisable all patients with long-standing history of IBD to do a bone densitometry to check for osteopenia and osteoporosis. Definitely on yearly basis if they already have, and on, on every two to three years basis if they do not have. So again, we need to treat them. That's why we need to collaborate with our rheumatological uh, rheumatology colleagues and give them supplements with calcium and vitamin D. And if they have osteoporosis, then bisphosphonate is warranted for the treatment of osteoporosis. Now, moving on to the therapeutic consideration, anytime we are dealing with patients with IBD, we always have to ask ourselves, is the extra intestinal manifestations uh, uh, related to the activity, bowel activity itself? If yes, then treatment of bowel activity is mandatory. Again, we have to pick the right medication that targets not only the GI tract, but also that targets the extra intestinal manifestation. Because as you all know, some IBD treatment do not target, and they're more gut specific, and there are not much studies that support the use of these medications in extra intestinal manifestations. Again, and the second thing that we should ask ourselves, does the extra intestinal manifestation need specific treatment outside from the treatment of IBD? That's why it's important to collaborate with dermatologists, rheumatologists, and ophthalmologists, because sometimes we cannot treat them as the way, same way that ophthalmologists and rheumatologists treat the underlying disease. Now, this is a retrospective large cohort uh, German data from real world, looking at the, how the extra intestinal manifestations actually decrease with time when we treat the patients with anti-TNF. And this is a, a one-year follow-up, and as you can see, up to 50% of patients actually resolve their extra intestinal manifestations from baseline when you treat them with uh, anti-TNF. Now, this is also uh, IBD treated with anti-TNF, uh, this, this study looked at the prevalence of IBD in uh, patients, uh, uh, the prevalence of extra intestinal manifestations of IBD, and what's the course of treatment. And here they treated all, all the patients with extra intestinal manifestations with anti TNF. And as you can see, we have a complete resolution of one, uh, uh, not complete, partial resolution of these manifestations. And the most commonly used uh, uh, anti TNF were infliximab and adalimumab. So again, we target these patients with anti-TNF because you all know that the driver of extra intestinal manifestations is, is TNF-alpha. This is another cohort also looking at the treatment of anti-TNF for extra intestinal manifestations. And uh, mostly, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the overall outcome from anti-TNF. First of all, we have improvement in up to, seven, up to 75% of patients 
on infliximab and up to 70% uh, in adalimumab. And we have improvement in uh, 20 to 30 percent of patients. Only minority got actually got worse. So if you sub, uh, subdivide these extra intestine manifestations, pluviitis, arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and pyoderma gangrenosum, you can see that uveitis and arthritis respond the best for, with anti-TNF with a resolution in up to 80 to 89% of patients with uveitis and arthritis. So again, uh, stating the fact that anti-TNF is the cornerstone, uh, corner, corner treatment of uh, extra intestine manifestations. Now, again, this is another one looking at the Inspirada study, which was a single arm, multi, multi center, open label study, the use of adalimumab in ulcerative colitis, and also looking at extra intestinal manifestations. And you can see over time, over 12 months period, uh, 26 weeks, you can see that there is almost 50% reduction in not just the intestinal manifestations, but also the extra intestinal manifestations over time. And this was also durable uh, for after one year. Now, if you compare, uh, anti-TNF with uh, uh, vedolizumab, for example. This is a study that was published also in 2018 by uh, Mario Dubinsky, comparing patients with anti-TNF and vedolizumab. And you can see that patients who were uh, with Crohn's disease, who were treated with vedolizumab, 28% were more likely to, to develop extra intestinal manifestations. However, Patients with ulcerative colitis received vedolizumab did not have any statistically significant for any or the general extra intestinal manifestations. However, some developed specific extra intestinal manifestations while treated with vedolizumab, for example, after stomatitis, pyodonia ganglionism, and PSC. This is also to state the fact that, again, author's conclusion that the gut selective immunomodulators can do not work as good as anti-TNF in this case. So this is why we need more data on vedolizumab and on extra intestinal manifestations. If you also compare ustekinumab and tofacitinib, ustekinumab works very well on both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and somehow it works uh, on the axial um, uh, rheumatological and dermatological diseases. Uh, however, there's uh, some efficacy in psoriasis mostly. Uh, we have good data in psoriasis and in arthritis. However, we have very limited data on ankylosing spondylitis and also very uh, only scattered case reports on uveitis and, and, uh, and uh, peripheral arthritis. So again, it's not the first line treatment for IBD with extra intestinal manifestation. Similarly with tofacitinib, versus anti-TNF, we have only uh, case reports of extra intestinal manifestations or IBD in the literature. And recently, you know, the uh, safety concern with high dose dofacitinib, again, we have to take this into consideration. And again, with childbearing age uh, uh, patients, we should not be uh, using dofacitinib. And for now, we, we should not be using it for uh, IBD with extra intestinal manifestations. Now, why am I stressing on the fact that uh, uh, TNF is the uh, treatment of choice in extra intestinal? Because over time and development of drugs, and the most commonly and the most studied is anti-TNF. The most solid evidence we have in the literature so far is the anti-TNF drugs. For example, we have more than 1,300 publications on infliximab and, anti and extra intestinal manifestations. We have more than 560 publications on adalimumab and extra intestinal manifestations. And as you can see, all other disease, uh, other molecules, for example, anti-interleukins, anti-integrants, and JAK inhibitors, we don't have really uh, supportive evidence so far to use them with uh, in patients who have extra intestinal manifestations of IVD. Now, this is the latest echo consensus looking at the extra intestinal manifestations and treatment guidelines. And let me run you quickly through this. We have the arthropathy and arthritis. First of all, it should be always uh, uh, be all managed by rheumatologists and gastroenterologists, not gastroenterologists alone, because sometimes there are some extra intestinal manifestations of peripheral arthropathies and musculoskeletal diseases that can be treated, not just by biologics, some, sometimes anti-inflammatory for a short period of time, sometimes methotrexate and sulfatsalazine. If, if these patients actually a refractory treatment, then anti-TNF are, are warranted for treatment. For example, peripheral arthropathy is also, also we need to treat underlying disease, sometimes with short-term non-steroidals, sometimes corticosteroids might be helpful for a short period of time. However, if these patients are persistent and arthritis is persistent, we can always methotrexate, sulfasalazine, and anti-TNF. Similarly to skin disease, again, it should always be in collaboration with our uh, dermatologic colleagues, 
Again, you should treat underlying IBD because sometimes it parallels the disease activity. Systemic steroids in only severe cases, and in case we have relapsing of the erythemonodosum, even if we have quiescent IBD, we can treat them with immunomodulators and anti-TNF. Uh, pyodoma gangrenosum, definitely uh, anti-TNF uh, is warranted because these are more aggressive diseases than pyodoma gangrenosum. Similarly to eye disease, episcleritis and scleritis or uveitis, sometimes we can simply manage it by topical applications by ophthalmologists and in severe cases and refractory cases, of course, immunosuppressants and anti-TNF. This is, again, to, uh, to support the fact that we should not be treating the extra intestinal manifestations alone. It should always be in collaboration with rheumatologists, ophthalmologists, and dermatologists. Now, again, this is to summarize that regardless of what IBD you have and what extra intestinal manifestations, the most commonly used and studied is the, are the anti-TNFs, regardless of what uh, we have extra intestinal manifestations, it should always be considered. And as you can see, anti integrins JAKs, and interleukin, the uh, clinical indication is very uh, is not that solid, and we have no enough evidence to use them. So again, uh, treatment consideration, adalimumab and infliximab both are indicated and suitable for different types of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis with ankylosing spondyl uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis, Immunomodulators are not effective for the treatment of uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis or uh, the neurological manifestation, although they might help in peripheral arthritis. So again, for patients with IBD who have more persistent arthritis, adding immunosuppressants such as methotrexate should be, could be uh, effective. For example, if you have a quiescent IBD maintained on, for example, 5-ASA, uh, and you have extra intestinal manifestations or arthritis, we should not jump into giving anti-TNFs. We can simply add methotrexate with our colleagues, rheumatologists, and it can do the job. And if this fails, then we can give them anti-TNFs. So, dear colleagues, as a sum up for uh, uh, extra intestinal manifestations of IBD, IBD, as you all know, is a systemic inflammation, not just all intestine, but up to 50% can have extra intestinal manifestations in more than one uh, EM EIM. It can occur at any time during the course, disease course. It can precede IBD diagnosis or it can uh, come after the diagnosis. It, we should be collaborating with uh, ophthalmologists, uh, uh, rheumatologists, and dermatologists. It's important to early recognize extra intestinal manifestations because the earlier to treat, similarly in IBD, the earlier you treat the disease, the better the outcome and complications for the future. Anti-TNF have the strongest data so far supporting their efficacy in the treatment of not just uh, intestinal, but also extra intestinal manifestations of IBD. And I really want to thank you for uh, attention, uh, and I hope I did not pass my time. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilio. Uh, very punctual. Huh? One minute, extra one minute only. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Uh, great. Thank you for this uh, very informative presentation. I just wanted, uh, we have one question from the from the participant concerning azathioprine and the extra intestinal manifestation. I guess you you briefed it that it's it's not the best choice, right? You agree? Yes, I, absolutely. Um, it's not the best choice. However, we have data on some uh, extra uh, rheumatological manifestations. It it's not supportive in neither dermatological nor ophthalmological manifestations. We Some old data support that sometimes if we have mild uh, 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 per, uh, peripheral arthritis, we can try to give uh, uh, method, uh, not methotrexate, uh, azathioprine for the use. However, the data is not that solid and we hope we have more uh, solid evidence on anti-TNF. So if your patient is already on azathioprine and they develop uh, arthritis or peripheral arthropathies, it's worthwhile uh, shifting to anti-TNF or adding anti-TNF. Thank you a lot. Uh, I don't know if there's any question from, uh, from the participants. Yes, yes. Hi, right. Saeed. Hi, yes, hi, Dr. Khoury. Salim. Hi, Cecilio. Thank you. Hi, Salim. Uh, Good to see you. Yes, me too. Uh, and without Cecilio, the mask, uh, even. Okay. Hey, uh, <laughs> Cecilio, I'm going to ask you a question about combination uh, uh, of uh, biologics. I know you, you are aware of this problem, and I think you have avoided to, to talk about it. So give me your opinion about combinating uh, uh, biologics in extra intestinal manifestation, severe intestinal manifestation. 
Well, this is a huge topic and this is a nice question. And you all know I have, we have emerging data now, some scattered data on combination of, ex, of uh, biologics. But first of all, let's not forget about the cost and about the side effects. So the data so far that actually, uh, 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 that has been presented in the latest echo, a combination of, for example, anti-TNF with vedolizumab. For, because you know, vedolizumab is a safe medication, it's the relatively safe uh, biologic. So there are one date, there are some data on uh, severe uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis by a combination of anti-TNF and vedolizumab. Actually, they did much better. But again, we cannot start uh, uh, preaching about the combination of IBD of, of, of biological treatment of uh, uh, different diseases before having really a good consensus. Definitely, these data are emerging. We have lots of case reports on that. But again, I. I would not be talking about this because I don't think it's time, prime time to talk about combination. But of course, you know the data that it is emerging on combine, combining different biological treatment. But side effect profile is number one concern and cost is also a concern for nowadays. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We may, we may have a place for one small question. Okay. I guess no more questions. Uh, thank you a lot, Cecilio. Uh, now the opening ceremony thank you guys. will follow. Hope to see you soon. Hopefully. Uh, Take good care of yourself. Thank you. I'll see you, my friend. Yeah, we have one more question, please. Ah, OK. OK, great. Uh, good morning. Um, my question, in case of a recently diagnosed IBD, um, so this patient has been just diagnosed. They say that we have an indication to start some biologic treatment. We still do not have extraintestinal manifestations, but we, will, we still do not know how the course of the disease is going to be. For this very reason, and the potential extraintestinal manifestations, do you advise that we keep up uh, with the anti-TNF that we already know for this very reason? Yani the patient, we still do not know if he, he will develop extraintestinal manifestations or not. Do we still consider anti-TNF as first line? Well, that's a good question. Um, first of all, um, the, the treatment should be based on the severity of IBD. So if you have a patient with moderate to severe Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, even, the, even if without extra intestinal manifestations, we should start biologic, regardless whether anti-TNF, whether vedolizumab, whether istekinumab, or any other biologics or small molecules. And again, if your patient down the line developed extra intestinal manifestations on for example, vedolizumab or ustekinumab, you can always shift to anti-TNF and vice versa. Your patients, if they fail anti-TNF, you can always shift them to other biologics. So again, there are data to shift from other biologics. For example, if your patient, you decided to give them ustekinumab or vedolizumab, and you know that they are not the best treatment for extra intestinal manifestations. If your patient initially is diagnosed with IBD without extra intestinal manifestations, you can start any biologic you want with anti-TNF or not. So if you choose to give ustekinumab or vedolizumab and down the line your patient developed extra intestinal manifestations, either you keep them on ustekinumab or vedolizumab and add, for example, methotrexate if it's a peripheral arthropathy, or simply you can shift them to anti-TNF. So you can always interplay between different biologic depending on what's the clinical presentation. But if your patient is now without extra intestinal manifestations, you can choose any, any biologic, whether anti-TNF or not, and then according to uh, 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 progression of the disease, for example, if they later on develop ocular or dermatological or rheumatological diseases, you can choose to change or add on. So if your patient does not have extra intestinal manifestation, it's not only the first line, you can also choose other biologic, and we have supportive evidence to use them as a first line, not just anti-TNF, but also vedolizumab, vedolizumab, tofacitinib, all other biologics can be used as a first line. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. No more questions, please. Uh, and we'll proceed to the opening ceremony. Thank you again, Cecilia. Thank you.
شکران بداية مرحب بممثل معالي وزير الصحة دكتور حمد حسن الدكتور جوزيف حلو مدير العناية الطبية في الوزارة رئيس مجلس إدارة مستشفى النجف الشعبية اللبنية دكتور محمد مهدي السيدة منى أبو زيد مدير عام مستشفى النجف الشعبية اللبنانية رئيس الجمعية السورية لأمراض الجهاز الهضمي الدكتور منصور نصر الدين ممثل الجمعية اللبنانية لأمراض الجهاز الهضمي الدكتور فادي دانيال الحضور الكريم ضيوفنا الكرام من مصر ومن أمريكا والسعودية بين مخاطر جائحة كورونا وظروف اقتصادية صعبة يمر بها لبنان ما زال بإمكاننا أن نلتقي من جميع المناطق ومن بلاد مختلفة وهناك من لم يستطع الوصول نلتقي تحت راية العلم حيث لا فرق بين عربي وأعجمي وحيث الكل واحد كما في كل عام لنا شرف استضافتكم ما بين مستشفى النجا الشعبية في النبطية واستراحة سور بين مدينتين لهما من التاريخ ما لا تختصره الكلمات وما نقوم به اليوم وإياكم هو قيمة علمية مضافة يبعث فينا الشعور بالفخر إن إقامة مؤتمر علمي بهذا الشكل وبهذا الحجم ليس تفصيلا صغيرا وليس شيئا تراه كل يوم وقد لا أكون مخطئا إذا قلت بأنه المؤتمر الأول الذي ينعقد في لبنان في السنتين الأخيرتين في ظل الظروف الصحية والاقتصادية القاسية بعتقد ما في مجنون ممكن يعمل مؤتمر يعني هالأيام ما حدا بيقدر بس زهر حميني بيقدر وعمل بالإضافة إلى إمكاناتنا المتواضعة في مستشفى النجا الشعبية والتي نحلم بأن تكبر وتتقدم وبكل تأكيد هذا ممكن ومؤتمرنا هذا خير دليل يعني استرس اللي مرق فيه الدكتور زاهر وبعد عمره فيه هلا حسب ما خبرني عم يقطع على خير بيستاهل بيج لايك مع خمس نجوم ولعلنا اليوم سناخذ استراحه من الحديث عن كيفيه ايجاد البنزين للذهاب الى اعمالنا او عن شكل الحكومه المقبله او عما ينتظرنا غدا سنضع كل السيئات جانبا ونقوم بالشيء المفيد الوحيد الذي نبرع فيه انتاج المعرفه سنتكلم باسم العلم فبالعلم سننجو ورغم الخراب هناك فسحه امل فسحه علم ستنقلنا بلا شك الى عالم افضل الشكر للقيمين على استراحه سور السياحيه لاستضافتهم الكريمه والشكر للاطباء الكرام الذين شاركونا حضورا وعبر الانترنت ولم يبخلوا بتقاسم تجربتهم العلميه معنا الشكر للمنظمين والشكر للطواقم الطبيه والفنيه والشكر للشركات التي ساهمت باجهزتها ومعداتها الشكر لكم لحضوركم على امل ان نلتقي في العام المقبل بعد أن نكون قد أنجزنا العمل في بناء قسم التنظير الجديد في المستشفى إلى اللقاء في العام القادم ضمن فعاليات ليبانو لايف 5G برو ماكس وشكراً كلمة ممثل رئيس الجمعية اللبنانية لأمراض الجهاز الهضمي يلقيها الدكتور فادي دانيال لتفضل ثانك يو معالي الزملاء ما ما عندي كلمه مكتوبه بتصور دكتور فوعاني كفى ووفى بعتقد كلنا رح نسني على الجهود اللي جباره البذلها صديقنا زاهر 
وكلنا بنعرف انه الجمعيه اللبنانيه للجهاز الهضمي من اول ما بلشت هالمؤتمر او هالكونفرنس من 2012 هي دعمته هي وراه وزاهر تيبكلي الشخص اللبناني مثل ما كان الله يرحمه عمي مشيناها خطى كتبت علينا ومن من كتبت عليه خطى مشاها فزاهر مشاها للاخر وبعرف انه كلنا محبطين وكلنا كل واحد عم بفكر بالفله وبنسمع على طول بذات القصص الرناني غير التضييق الجنائي والحكومه هجره الادمغه ها هجره الادمغه هجره الادمغه لسبب اني صرت عم حس حالي بلا دماغ انه بيبقى مضبوط يمكن بلا دماغ بس بالنهايه نحن مؤمنين كنا مجبرين او غير مجبرين من دون ما نلوم يلي عم يضطروا يسافروا نحن باقيين هون وزاهر هو خير مثال على الريزيلينس تبع اللي لبناني قد ما فيك تقول هلا منهم بيقولوا لبناني كثير ريزيلينت لانه بعد لا في بنزين ولا في شيء لوين بدنا نوصل مش هون بيت القصيد نحن بالنهايه بدنا نضل بالشق العلمي والشق الثقافي نحن هون لحتى نبقى وهالمحاضره مثل ما قال دكتور فعاني هي اول وحده من بعد لهيدا وكانت ريلي اي انجويد انه شفت كذا شخص صار لي اكثر من سنه مش شايفهم حضوريا سو so, uh, بدنا نشكر زاهر بدنا نشكر كمان الدعم لانه كمان لو ما الدعم المادي تبع الشركات ما كان هالشيء حصل وبنعرف انه وورلد وايد القصه كلها من ناحيه ناحيه الايكونوميكال عم بتصير اكثر واكثر صعبه سو so, نحن شاكرين كمان لكل الناس اللي دعموا ماديا يعني شركه الادويه وشركه الميديكال ديفايسز يلي دعموا لنا زاهر عم عم كيف عم بكفوا دعمهم لنا بجمعيه الدنيه لاطباء الجهاز الهضمي وبتمنى انه هالبلد يخلص ويصال على بر الامل ثانك يو فور ليسنينج كلمة وزير الصحة اللبنانية يلقيها الدكتور جوزيف الحلو تفضل يعطيكم العافية ونهاركم سعيد هاي تاني مرة بيجي على المؤتمر من سنتين كان عم بيحلم دكتور زاهر اشتركنا بالحلم من سنتين وبلشنا وقلت له أكيد نحن بندعم وخاصة بهالايام الصعبة هلا اللي عم نمر فيها لبنان كلها والشعب اللبناني ككل. أنا بدي أتشكر أول شيء معالي الوزير إنه أرسلني لأنا مسته بهاللقاء بهالمؤتمر ببعثكم تحياته وبدي وجه شكر كمان لكل اللي شاركوا بهالمؤتمر من اطباء وزملاء كانوا في لبنان ولا برات لبنان عبر الاونلاين بس الاهم اول شيء اسمحوا لي بدي انحني قدام الجهاز الطبي في لبنان اللي صلوا سنتين وانا خير من رفقوا بهالسنتين اللي عم نقاوم بحرب ضد شغلي ما انا شايفينا كل الحروب بتشوف عدوك بتعرف عن مين عم تقتل بس هالفيروس الكورونا الجهاز الطبي في لبنان والتمريضي قتل وبلشنا من لا شيء وراح منهم شهداء وفي منهم كثير تاذوا واللي قاوموا اكثر شيء المستشفيات الحكوميه اللي بلشت ورجل تحقت المستشفيات الخاصه بعد فتره بس الجهاز الطبي اللبناني اثبت انه جدير بالاحترام مثل ما كان كل عمره مثل ما كان كل عمرنا لبنان نحن السياحه الصحيه صار في شويه خضات في لبنان هلا مثل ما قال الدكتور دانيال انه بعد الادمغه مش قصه بعد الادمغه في كثير ادمغه بلبنان بعدها وراح تضل طمن بالك ما حدا راح يفل اللي بده يفل بكون عم بيركض على شيء ثاني مش عم بيركض على الادمغه بس اللي قربوا في كثير قربوا انا انا بالوزاره اعطيت 2561 افاده حسن سلوك ليفلوا بس كونوا اكيدين وانا على تواصل معهم للحكمه اللي راحوا اول شيء باول المرحله يمكن استفادوا ولا ولا مشي حالهم بس اللي عم بيروحوا هلا كونوا اكيدين عم يتمقطعوا فيهم كثير مش ما ينبسطوا كثير انه رايحين هلا عم يتمقطعوا فيهم كثير وخاصه بالطبيب اللبناني والممرض الممرضه اللبنانيه بهالظروف الصعبه اللي كلياتنا بنعرفها 
نحن طلبنا بس لدكتور فعاني لجيبه نحن طلبنا خطيا معالي الوزير طلب خطيا من وزارة الطاقة أنه الطبيب والممرض يعني عم نحكيها بكل أسف أنه صرنا عم عم نترجى للطبيب يعبي بنزين قبل غيره ليقدر يروح على شغله ولا الممرض ولا المرضى يروحوا على شغلهم عم عم نستجدي صرنا البنزين مع الاسف الشديد يعني بنحكيها بمراره بس بكل هالظروف الصعبه في ناس كانت عم تركض لتعمل المؤتمر الطبي تجمع فيه اطباء من لبنان وبرات لبنان يعني بكل هالسواد بتلاقي شمعه بالاخر انه اللبناني بيرجع بينطفد بيرجع طائر الفنيك بينطفد واكيد انا على طول بقول لهم قد ما تعتم الدنيا على طول الساعه 6 الصبح بده يطلع الضوء ما في مجال قد ما تمروا الايام علينا صعبه ما بدي فوت بال بال بالشق السياسي ولا هذا كلياتنا عم نتضايق بلبنان كلياتنا عم نتعذب انا اكثر واحد يمكن بالمستشفيات بلبنان مع المرضى عم بعاني كل يوم بيومه مع المرضى بكل مستشفيات لبنان عم نشوف قديش صعوبه عم نشوف قديش صعوبه الميديكال سبلايز ولا الامبلنت اللي اللي عم بعيزوا الحكيم اوقات بالشركه ما عم بتلاقي اوقات الشركه ما بتسلمه بدها كاش المستشفى كمان يعني هالمشاكل كلها عايشينها وبرضو عم نقاوم انه ما نضل ما نضل هون وما نضل نشتغل يمكن في حكا ما فلت وكل كل واحد بيعرف مصلحته بس بالنهايه نحن كوزاره صحه وهي بدعم مباشر من معالي الوزير نحن طلبنا هلا عم نعمل تعرفت المستشفيات وتعرفت اتعاب الاطباء تقريبا رح صرنا على الخط النهايه مع كل الصناديق الضامنه رح نزيد رح نزيد التعرفه والميزانيات 160% تقريبا للمستشفيات وكمان الكال للاطباء كمان يمكن مش كافيه بس نوعا ما احسن من هلا بالاسعار اللي موجوده هلا بس نحن خلصنا باجتماعنا اخر مره انه مع كل الصناديق الضامنه لحتى نكون كلمه وحده لتكون الدوله عم بتساعد كل الصناديق الضامنه مش عم تساعد بمطرح معين لاحظتوا التعاونيه الضمان الجيش زادوا 70% رجعنا اقترحنا نحن اخر شيء انه ينزاد 160% وكل الصناديق الضامنه تلحقنا على اساس انه الدوله والحكومه الجديده اللي جايه تكبر ميزانيه القطاع الصحي في لبنان لكل الصناديق الضامنه. بدي ارجع اتشكركم مره ثانيه لكل القيمين على المؤتمر وعلى اللقاء الكثير حلو كل سنه بننطر مناطره وخاصة بهال بهالوضع السيء وخاصة بالجهاز الهضمي كل العالم اللي عم بتعصب وهذا عم بتأثر عليها بس يمكن انتم عم بتلاقوا ادوية للمعدة نحن مش عم نلاقي عم نتعذب صرنا لحتى المريض يلاقي دواء لحماية المعدة يعني لسخرية القدر بدي اقول انا بلبنان بس بدي ضوي شوي صغيرة قديش تعذبتوا وعم تتعذبوا مع مرضاكم لتلاقي ادوية ولسوء الحظ الشوفه اللي شفناها بمستودعات الادويه بتبكي بتبكي يعني لا انسانيا لا اخلاقيا لا ضميريا لا مادي وشو بدك تقول تسمي عن هالشخص اللي عم يحتكر شيء مش طبيعي ادويه كل العالم عايزتها طيب عم تخليها لتربح طيب صار لك 30 سنه عم تربح مرق لنا اياها هالشهرين ثلاثه نحطهم بالسوق في حدا كبن وما اعطاهم للعالم طيب هاي بدوش تضيع وقت بدوش محاكمة وبدوش حبس وبدوش صين وجين بقلب الديبو علقوا بقلب الديبو عم بيعمل جريمة مش عم بيقتل شخص عم بيقتل مجتمع بحاله لا تشحد دواء انا في مريضة تلفنت لي بأول مداهمة هون بجنوب على الدواء وسمعت شو اسمه الدواء والله العظيم تلفنت لي الساعه 12 بالليل عم تبكي قالت لي بس قل لي مين صاحب ولا روح انا اخنه صار لي سنه عم بنبش على هالدواء وعم بشحد وشهاده من برات لبنان عم بجيبه والدواء مستف عنده بالديبو ارباح ما حدا عم بيقول لك كل انسان تاجر بحب يربح بس بهالوقت هذا التاجر بده بده ينزل من حقه المستشفى بدها تنزل من حقها، الطبيب عم ينزل من حقه، 
كل العالم بدها تنزل من حقها للمواطن لا يوصل له لحقه اضعف واحد فينا كلنا سوا هو المريض المريض اللي بيجي على المستشفى هو اضعف شيء لازم كليتنا نتعاون لنساعده للمريض وان شاء الله ان شاء الله السنه الجاي ضلينا طيبين بهالمؤتمر بتكون كل هالازمات باذن الله انحلت ومثل ما قلت اول شيء انه قد ما تعتم الدنيا الساعه 6 الصبح بده يرجع يطلع الضوء يعطيكم الف عافيه
هنا بالبيئه هون بيقول لي لا مطلوب بس شو هون قلبي شو اسمه شو حق؟ من اول كبسه من اول كبسه هون وثمانيه حلت يعني لا انا عم ضبط لك كادرك لك انا بالنسبه لي عم بعطيك اللي بدك اياه هيدا شو لا انا بالشنطة القليلة اللي هنا هفتح لها اياهم كلهم اذا هي شطت وما مثل حالها لا تقلي فيك مرة ثانية لا راوند اب رح يقعد جروب حتى ما اثنين هون هل اللي لابس هول المحجب رح يقف هون تقدم هول الكاتب اوكي منبلش علي هاني ابراهيم حط صور خلينا نجيب لك لا هيدا خلص رح
هولي الاكلات اللي بتاعت الزي ايه مظبوط واذا حط اي هلا لا انا هولي ما راح انا اللي بدي اياها انت يعني بس روح باي بيت خلص هو كله انت هاي انا بس كل اللي فوق هيدا انا بدي بس اخر شيء يعني بعد الاسماء اللي بدي فيهم هن هول اللي فيهم بس اوكي ما بدك تحطي بيضيوت لانه هو قال لي بيضيوت لا لا رح ارجع اكتب الكل هو اوريدي شافوهم امبارح كلهم ما هيك
Okay, can, can you hear me? The FD did post-marketing studies indicating a 5% rate of culture positive scopes despite reprocess. That's a huge failure rate, one in 20 patients is at risk. That's something that should really wake us all up and have us look at what we can do better and how we can redesign scopes. Disposable tips of scopes will help, but it's not the long-term answer. Either the reusable scopes have to come out of something better, where um, complete sterilization is actually possible, or I think the future is going to align with disposable scopes. Clearly, where the field is going is towards use of single-use device. And the more we try and the more we uh, get familiar with it, because it's going to be a game change for the, for the field of interventional endoscopy. Once I began the procedure, I completely could not tell I was using a disposable instrument. I forget I'm using a disposable scope and I'm working on this. I think what we're living through right now is the beginning of a transformation in healthcare where we're going to look back 10 years from now and say, I can't believe we were using you know, scopes that we reused over and over again. So it gives us a nimbleness to address clinician needs. It gives us the ability to iterate on a pace that has never been seen before. And it manages some really serious problems in endoscopy in a way that, that no one's ever been able to do before.
خلاص خلاص انا بعد بس بدي بالاضافه لكل التشكرات اللي عملناها للاصحاب والاحباب و والاكسبرت من برا ومن جوا ومن كل المحلات وهذا بدي اشكر ساينس برو على هالتنظيم البروفيسيونال وبدي اشكر الشباب اللي كانوا مسؤولين عن النقل بقياده باسل ذا اكواير برافو برافو لو ما انتم ما كنا كمان نجحنا هلا رح ننتقل لل أكيد الشرك وكل اللي دعمونا ما بدنا نضلنا نعيد نفس الحكي بس يمكن لأنه ما ذكرناهم بالاسم لا سانس برو بس هلا ما نعمل بس لايف راوند اب صغير ما حنتقلها نص ساعة رح نحكي ثلاثة كيسز نقيناهم من الكيسات اللي اشتغلناهم امبارح بس نعمل ديسكشن مع الاكسبيرت أول شيء مرحبا وشكرا لحضوركم أكيد طيب أول كيس امبارح هتبين معي كمبيوتر سلايد اوكي سو أول كيس كانت 77 years old male patient هرجع بس بريف هيستوري one year ago كان complaining of bad breath dysphonia recurrent choking the gastroscopy showed zincers diverticulum at 17 cm from the dental arch with mild hiatal hernia So uh, ZPOM was done by Dr. Mayan Khashab for this long diverticulum extending over five centimeter. The four steps that uh, he did, uh, the first one, the mucosal opening, then the tunneling, septotomy, and the, the last is the mucosal, mucosal closure. And in this case, the mucosa was closed by 12 clips, which as Dr. Mayan, it's weird. Oh, it's not unusual, right? So the discussion is uh, when to go for ZPOM versus diverticulotomy using uh, the diverticulotom, and what is the unusual in this case? The difficulty was that the diverticulum was big. And the last thing we did mucosal incision. If we did the mucosal incision, بتكون عم نسكر بس الانسجن يلي هي هوريزنتال انه هيك جيلسي فبتكون بتكون الكلوجر كثير سهله ومنا كليبس اقل هلا نحن بس عملنا ميوكوزال انسجن معناتها صارت سي مثل هيك سي شيب فكبرت الانسجن عشان هيك كنا استعملنا 12 كليبس والدايفرتيكولوم از هيوج فاذا عملتي فيرتيكال انسجن فور ا بيج دايفرتيكولوم Uh, 12 كنا عم نوفر لو عندي انا كنا استعملنا 15 بس ظاهر بيزعل مني اذا استعملنا 15 <تصفيق> بس ذس واز ريلي بيج بس المين بوينت از فور ا دايفرتيكولوم ذس بيج اور ذس لارج يو هاف تو ميك ان ميوكوزال انسجن كنا عم نحكي فيها امبارح خلال العمليه لانه بيكون في كثير ميوكوزا يعني في الفلاب ميوكوزا الفلاب بيكون كبير هلا الدايفرتيكولو دايفرتيكولو سكوب انت قصدك بحكي دايفرتيكولو سكوب ما موجوده عندنا بامريكا ما في منها ما بنستعملها هلا في كم واحد بيستعملوها باوروبا بس اتس نوت وورلد اتس نوت يوزد وايدلي اي كان تيل يو ف فما عندي اكسبيرينس فيها أنا ليا برضو كومنت على اليوزنج أوف دايفرتيكلو توم هي ميزة الزي بويم عن الدايفرتيكلو توم إن إحنا وي آر كاتينج ذا سيبتوم أندر فيجن أب تو بروفيسور معين كمان هو إكستندينج المايوتوم إمبارح يعني هو خلص السيبتوم أندر فيجن وي كان سي ذا إند أوف سيبتوم أند وي كان إكستند ذا مايوتومي أنتيل ذا أبر أوسوفيجيال ماسل ويتش إز less recurrence so we are ensure that we cutting the septum completely and this uh, will be less recurrent in the reticular tomb uh, we will cut and we didn't see the end of the septum there is no study comparing uh, these two methods no no, no. so we uh, we compared the standard septotomy to ZPOM to surgical technique. 
uh, paper is coming up in, in endoscopy and there's no difference in, uh, in efficacy and short-term uh, recurrence. But I told you, know, it's a retrospective. I'm now a randomized trial. Uh, it's a European study we're participating in. Uh, we're looking at outcomes at two years. Any questions from the audience about this case? So this was the case of a 67 years old male who had uh, a huge polyp, which we removed partially and it was uh, discontinued the procedure because of hemodynamic instability and bleeding. So uh, the remnant polyp was, uh, I think it re uh, regrows. So it was two centimeter and uh, there uh, was scar from the previous polypectomy. There was a good lifting with normal sign and indigo carmine. It was removed in two pieces using uh, the hot snare polypectomy. So the discussion here, what were the other options in uh, removing this polyp if lifting didn't occur? And what was the risk during this procedure? Dr. Shaima Maleta in an excellent way. Um, this illustrates the difficulties of resection of residual polyps. The residual polyps is always going to be scarring. Scar of polyps. As we saw in the past, if you go to scar, we'll scar that, whatever amount that you'll be injecting, there will be no claim to this sect. So we were lucky to find a place uh, where the mucosa was not uh, fibrosed. And with the injection, with a steady flow, with a jet, uh, we could have good lifting. So we proceeded to a resection. Even if it's piecemeal, it's okay. And even if we are expecting to have a small injury of the muscle, we can close it safely. Recently, hot biopsy command of the address. That be uh, add on more security. Hatta, uh, I think in the cystic serrated polyps, if you are resecting cystic serrated polyps in a piecemeal way, you have to continue the edges and you have to secure the edges with the uh, hot bounce. Then Shaima, I think Shaima is here. Shaima is she here. can comment yes. also. Shaima. Is But I wanted to ask Maine about the practice of hot biopsy. We are seeing it more and more uh, experts performing hot biopsy. Even if, if the piece, uh, rather, even if, if you are having good visualization of the margins mm. and you are uh, looking at the margin in a safe way. So, yeah, so, so we have to be careful with this recommendation. Uh, so, the hot biopsy forceps is associated with increased risk of perforation. So we use, we use the hot biopsy forceps for avulsion. So if you have a scarred down polyp, you try to inject under it and then catch it with the hot biopsy forceps, use endocut Q current and pull away from the muscle and take small pieces. So this is the avulsion, hot avulsion technique. But in terms of treating the edges, you, you use the snare tip. I advise against the use of the hot biopsy forceps because you know people are going to go push and and for a long time so we shouldn't recommend that but using the snare tip there's now level one data you know from michael Burke from australia if you treat the margins with uh, with soft coagulation current and the snare tip the recurrence rate is one percent which is uh, which is the best results we've ever, we've ever seen so different from uh, hot biopsy forceps Shaima. How uh, I usually طبعا the recurrent polyp uh, our residual polyp is very challenging. market fibrosis. So you have to use all the tools available. There is no strict tool what to do and what not to do. But there, yeah, you have to use all the tools to remove the residual polyp to ensure that you removed it and try hardly to coagulate to prevent the recurrence but first you have to be able to deal with perforation because the instance of perforation is going to be high um, especially that there is a scar okay 
This is the first thing. And the second thing about the polyp yesterday, there was part of the polyp that was not touched. So I call it the, this is the virgin part of the polyp that it was not, yes, it was, it was lifting. So I used the hybrid knife. I know that this is an expensive tool just to use it for injection, but I used the hybrid knife that caused very good lifting. So about 70% of it was lifted. So after removing it, there was a, uh, definitely there was a muscle injury with a fibrous scar. So we close it with the clips. So you have to use all your tools, the available tools according to each case, and you have to be prepared to close the perforation if it happens. And what about the EFTR in this case? So the first thing we do is uh, use the uh, suck and snare technique. So you put, uh, use an adult colonoscope uh, because the channel is 3.7 millimeters. Then you can suction well, put a cap on the scope and you open the snare and you suck this, the, the polyp. Although it's scarred, you can suck some polyp into the snare and then you cut. It's very hard to suck muscle into the snare and the cap. So it's a very safe technique, the suck and the snare and then with the hot avulsion. Uh, for whatever remains. If this fails, we use a device called Full Thickness Resection Device, FTRD, from Ovesco. It works very well for scarred polyps, and there's good experience. I do it all the time, but that's the last resort. You know, it's an expensive tool. You still can do it with a forceps and snare 99% of the times. But for FTRD, I think there's a diameter limit of two centimeters. So for FTRD, if the polyp is uh, non-scarred, you can do like three, four, because you can uh, suction a lot. But if it's scarred, then it's two, because you're not going to grab it well. I think still we have the option of ESD. If the scarred, what's the other option? If it's not probably lifting, still ESD is a last uh, option. Mm. Any questions from the audience? So moving to the last uh, case. Uh, that was the case of the 73 years old male uh, who had multiple stones in the extrahepatic biliary tree reaching the proximal aspect of the left intrahepatic biliary duct ranging from 0 0.7 to 2.5 centimeter. So um, the ARCP showed the uh, tiny CBD with a big stone, uh, Dr. Ammar did it, at 2.5 centimeter in the left biliary tree, spyglass uh, guided electrohydraulic light gypsy was done. Uh, failure to extract the fragmented stone because of the tiny CBD in the left biliary tree, and then plastic stent was uh, inserted. Also, we had another case uh, for Dr. Yasser, who a big stone, on a CBD stone, which was managed successfully with the sphincter macrodilatation. So uh, general question, how to manage large biliary stones and decide which is the appropriate uh, technique? So uh, I think in, in this case, um, this was a, a large stone and a large left duct with a small caliber CBD. And in this setting, I don't think a sphincter macrodilation would help at all. Uh, because the CBD is smaller and you're trying to extract a large stone from, from a large left duct. So, uh, so definitely in this particular case, spyglass was, uh, was the better option. Um, the reason, so we, we broke down the stone, which was a very hard stone. We had to use two uh, EHL uh, uh, catheters uh, fully. Um, these cases are frequently very difficult to finish in one, in one setting. So you you break down the stone and, uh, and then, you know, time sometimes helps uh, with this. And when you come back, uh, then sometimes you'll see that the, the pieces are even smaller and softer and then you can extract them. Um, there's, you can use a basket after that for the smaller pieces, get it up into the left duct. Um, and uh, the other possibility is doing further, another session of SPY with EHL to make the pieces even smaller to allow for an easier extraction from the uh, from the left duct, um, I don't. You know, in the absence of a stricture, I don't think dilation of the the entire duct is going to be helpful in this setting, and it could be dangerous. So, uh, so I, I don't think I would do that. I don't know if anyone would do anything different, but uh, 
but I would say either, you know, come back, use a, a, a basket, a wire guided basket up into the left duct as a first start. And then uh, if that's not successful, we can do another session of, uh, of SPY with, uh, with the HM. Any other comments? I mean, you answered all the questions. Mar, would you think of anything to facilitate the passage, like, for example, pla placing a fully covered metal stand that will open uh, more? Uh, I, I don't remember exactly how, how narrow was the distal duct. It was probably about uh, five, five to four or five centimeters. Okay. And the left duct is significantly smaller. Right. I remember that image. So, yeah. uh, I mean, it's always like the challenge is to allow that. Uh, like continuous drainage so the stones pass and also you uh, help prevent the re reformation of stones. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable uh, option to, you know, to place it and leave it in place that maybe the smaller fragments will go through it, but uh, I'm not sure it's gonna resolve it uh, on its own, but it, it might be helpful in that setting. Uh, Amor, I wanted to ask you about your experience about comparing EHL to laser, yeah, laser lysotripsy. Uh, is there any profile of the stone where you, you may change the decision from EHL to laser or si size or? I, I typically have, uh, I think it's a lot of times it's institution based. Some people have EHL, some people have laser. I haven't found, you know, many places that sort of interchangeably use both. I've used the HL uh, successfully the majority of the times. Um, I've used laser before, but I haven't used it very frequently. I don't think data-wise there's much difference between the between the two uh, methods. So I've, I've used the HL mostly. I don't know if Moin has any uh, thoughts. On that. So uh, <clears throat> so we've compared both, and for biliary stones they're equivalent, but the laser is better for pancreatic stones. You know, pancreatic stones are harder. Uh, so laser works better in the pancreas, uh, but for bile duct, I don't think uh, it matters. I, I think Amar did an excellent job with this, and there's really not much more to do here. Uh, if you put a metal stent, it's not going to expand beyond the diameter of the bile duct. And also you risk, uh, you know, the stone fragments are going to pass and obstruct the stent, so it's, a, it's an issue. You know, the, the uh, metal stent will occupy the entire duct, so if stones pass, they will obstruct it. The, uh, you know, if you put a couple of plastic stents, there's a wicking phenomenon, which means bile will drain between the stents uh, and not just through the stents. So I think it protects against cholangitis. So maybe just a few plastic stents, that's probably the way to go. And think sort of time, a couple of uh, more EHL uh, uh, procedures, uh, but that's the, I think that's the most you can do here. And what is the frequency of um residual stones after EHL. Uh, usually we are doing it under uh, direct vision, but sometimes we are surprised to find the uh, residual stones after uh, direct uh, lysis trips. So if you, uh, you're using spyglass, obviously, so when you finish, you can always, you've opened this, you can always take a look. The issue is uh, frequently you will see small pieces, but the question is, are they clinically relevant? You know, because you've done a big sphincterotomy, you've done sphincteroplasty. So most of these remaining small fragments are, uh, are clinically irrelevant. Any question from the audience? Okay, thank you. So we can move to the last session today with uh, Dr. Mark Barté and Dr. Moin. <clears throat> Okay, you can hear me now? Is it working? I don't know if, if you can hear me. Salut, Zah. 
Okay. So I hope you, you, you can hear me. I, I just want first to, uh, to deeply apologize not to be with you. Really, I'm so sorry. Uh, it was a real pleasure to be uh, in Lebanon with all my friends, Zaher, uh, Amar, uh, Mohan, and everyone. And so uh, it's not my decision, but it's due to my institution because I saw the, uh, the number of cases of uh, COVID, which is uh, so much important in my uh, town and my and the surrounding area. And so uh, they forbid uh, me to, to leave Marseille because we have uh, so emergency case uh, to, to, to manage. So again, I'm, I'm so sorry because, I, I, you know, I, I, I like a lot your country and I, I feel uh, Lebanese, Lebanese people uh, li like my brothers and sisters. So really, I'm, I'm very sorry. So I, I try to, to, to get some, some time to, to share some, uh, some time with, with, with you. I hope uh, uh, you can hear me and I will do my presentation if you if you agree. There, it's okay? Yes, yes. Okay. So again, uh, I, I apologize, but I, I'm I'm a little bit pleased to to share some some uh, some sometimes we with you. So just I, I want to speak about uh, EUS guided uh, bilirubin pancreatic drainage in alternate anatomy. Uh, why is this topic? Because we have more and more pa patients with alternate anatomy, mainly due to, to pancreatic surgery, but also to bilirubin surgery and to bariatric surgery, which is more and more frequent. And so this is a, a case to show uh, how the, uh, the, the endoscopic field uh, is improving and increasing more and more uh, with yours. Okay, uh, so um, when are we to, to, to use uh, uh, EUS guided bilirubin drainage in anatomy? Uh, Many we, ha we have uh, uh, two different cases, and the, the challenging uh, uh, procedure are uh, balloon uh, enteroscopy assisted USCP or uh, PTBD. Uh, we have uh, two main uh, indications uh, the case of uh, 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 Rooks and Y procedure, hepatico jejunostomy and Whipple procedure, uh, usually with uh, stenosis of the uh, uh, bilio uh, jejunal anastomosis. And this, this is managed by uh, EOS hepatico gastrostomy. I will try to give you uh, the recommendation of uh, uh, ESG uh, guidelines, which are very frequent and not yet published, but we are just finishing. Uh, it uh, and uh, to, today, uh, tomorrow we have, we have a meeting about that. Uh, I know more than that uh, uh, ASG uh, already produced uh, recommendations. Uh, and uh, uh, we have the second uh, case of indications. We are with bilateral bypass and afferent loop syndrome. And in this case, we can use EUS guided gastro gastrostomy, edge technique, or uh, EUS guided gastrogenostomy. And we try to show you some, uh, some videos. So how to do? Uh, of course, uh, uh, with EUS guided bilirubin drainage, you, you cannot use uh, cholecalidocardiostomy because it is alternate anatomy. So the main technique is hepaticogastrostomy because with hepaticogastrostomy, you can use uh, integrated uh, treatment with dilatation, with insertion of, of stent uh, uh, where you want. Uh, we, we know that this uh, EUS approach for bilirubin drainage is efficient. We have a huge meta-analysis uh, and showing that uh, uh, we have uh, about 92 to 94% of uh, clinical success, uh, but with a significant morbidity, uh, 20, about 20% 20 of the cases. And this is the main problem because uh, what is challenging is, is the learning curve to, to, to do, to be able to do uh, EUS uh, guided bilirubin drainage. And we are trying to, to develop uh, models uh, ex vivo models uh, to, to train uh, uh, an endoscopist. Uh, and uh, I, I told you we are going to, to, to produce uh, guidelines uh, for, uh, with ESG, and uh, we pulled a certain study comparing uh, uh, US hepatigosostomy and US cholecalidocardiostomy, and you see the very good results, uh, technical results, about 95% uh, in, in, in both cases, is, uh, they are the same. And the clinical results are 
88% of the cases. So very good result with, with uh, uh, EUS guided pyridinate, but take care to the, to the complications. So uh, we have uh, two step procedure with uh, hepatic vasostomy and internal anatomy. Uh, uh, and the main indication is uh, uh, stenosis of biliary, biliary jejunal anastomosis. And we put two double pigtail stent placement, but in a two step procedures, I will try to explain. And also we can tr uh, treat uh, intrahepatic biliary stones. I heard that the discussion about the last cases the last case uh, with uh, uh, EHL uh, with spyglass. So the first step is to perform uh, uh, hepatic gastrostomy, uh, leaving a, a fully covered metal stent, is to, to manage and access uh, to the intrahepatic bile duct. Uh, and uh, why uh, first step and not doing everything during one step is because you have no adhesion between the liver and the stomach and you have a huge risk of uh, biliary leakage. So first you insert the fully, met, uh, fully covered metal stand. Uh, you wait for one, two weeks to four weeks to have adhesion between the liver and the stomach. And after you can retrieve the stand and do what you want, uh, dilatation through the, 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 the liver, uh, uh, EHL uh, or uh, uh, stenting. Uh, so this is the second step, again, uh, two uh, weeks, two to four weeks later. And after you, you, you push a guide wire uh, alongside the tract you, you, you previously uh, have done. And after you can dilate and stenting and or, uh, uh, treating, and you see the balloon dilatation of the, of the uh, biliary jejunal uh, anastomosis, in this case, or treating stones. We, we, uh, we produced a, 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 a short case series uh, five years ago, and now we are still working. So I will speak about indications. So indications are mainly treating biliary jejunal stomosis after whipple procedures, after hepatic jejunal stomy, uh, everything like that. Uh, and I will show you the, the, the case. So this is uh, uh, one, uh, two, one month later, you see the fully covered metal stand and you can pass uh, uh, through the, the tract and you can reach, you see here the hepatic stomy uh, with the dilation of intrahepatic bile duct. And after you, you insert alongside the guide wire a balloon dilator and you, you, you can dilate the anastomosis. And the main problem is what about stenting? Because you have to be able to retrieve the stent and to exchange the stent every six months. So we use a very long double pigtail uh, stent. You see the fistula uh, between the stomach and the intrahepatic bile duct. And uh, I will show you, we use a uh, uh, double pigtail stent, uh, seven French, uh, not, not the straight one. Uh, this was the case uh, at the beginning. But uh, uh, now we use uh, this uh, stent, we are, which are seven French. A stand 15 centimeter lens. So uh, after you can push uh, over the guide wire and you will have a, 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 a tail uh, released inside the jejunum. You see the progression of the, of the, of the stand. Okay, now we are into the jejunum. You release the distal uh, uh, pigtail. Okay, and after you can release the proximal pigtail, which is in the stomach. So you have no risk of migration because you have two pigtails, one in the, in the jejunum and one in the, in, the, in the gastric lumen. So you can exchange it uh, very easily. And usually we put two, three, four uh, stands until we, 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 are, we have a, a good uh, uh, dilatation of the, of the anastomosis. And we do, we do that during uh, one year to two years, depending on, on the resolution of the of the, of the stenosis. But in some cases, we have of course intrahepatic biliary stones, and so what we do, uh, it, we we use uh, uh, cholangioscopy with with spyglass technique uh, for doing. You see the spyglass alongside the tract. We, we don't with hepatic gastrostomy, and we push over the guide wire. Uh, the, the, the spyglass inside the intrahepatic bile duct until we reach the anastomosis. And you see the anastomosis was the uh, huge stenosis and also a lot of stones just upstream to the anastomosis. So we have to, to crush the stones before trying to dilate 
<clears throat> the bilar with the anastomosis. So you see clearly the, the probe, which is uh, for EHL. Uh, and so we are going to crush uh, as, as the stunts. Okay, we do that until we crush, you see all the stunts. And also you can, uh, you can see the very teeny stenosis. You see the guide wire making a loop uh, in the antihepatic bile duct. And we, we will focus uh, on, on the very teeny anastomosis. We, uh, we, we do a lot of attempts. And now you see the guide wire passing through the very teeny uh, 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 stenosed anastomosis, and okay, and now we will be able to to, to make the dilation. This is uh, this is the anastomosis you see with the guide wire inside, and now we are going to push a, a balloon dilator, uh, doing the dilatation, and after uh, uh, pushing uh, the stent. And you see clearly the fistula. Uh, we are one month later, and you see the the waste on the balloon dilator, so you can treat and the patient very easily, like you do with PTBD, but it's inside the patient and this ambulatory procedure, daily procedure. So this is very comfortable for the patient and also for you because you have not to, to, to do any hospitalization and you have a very uh, a few complications uh, after the hepatic system. So what are the results of, of this technique? Okay, you see uh, this is a nice uh, uh, MRI image of uh, uh, biliary digital anastomosis. Uh, uh, so I told you that we have, we have two, uh, two procedures uh, challenging uh, this one. So uh, e, uh, uh, URCP, enteroscopy assisted URCP, or PTBD, percutaneous drainage. But you, you know that with percutaneous drainage, you have a high mobility rate. Uh, much higher than, than with EUS and uh, uh, with uh, uh, enteroscopy, uh, we pulled uh, 10 studies uh, in more than two, 200 patients and nearly 300 patients. And you see the success rate was only 70% compared to 95% of the cases. And in addition, with a very long duration, uh, more, than, more than one hour, usually close to two hours. So we have, we have some results. Uh, and you see, uh, but only retrospective series. This one show uh, uh, um, technical success in 85% uh, of the cases. You see, it was a Rooks NY, anastomosis, BRO2, Whipple procedures, um, bypasses. And this one is very interesting because uh, they included 37 patients. Uh, and they started with one, one stage uh, uh, intervention, but they are lo a lot of complication. Uh, mainly due to, to, to uh, biliary leakage. So they do the two-step in, uh, intervention uh, uh, in 26 cases, and uh, they had no more complication. And the first one with, was with a one-stage uh, uh, intervention. So if you do that, you have to do two-step intervention, one to, to manage the access to the intrahepatic bile duct, and one month later uh, to, to manage the stenosis of the uh, biliary digital anastomosis. And you see, we have a high rate of clinical success. This is our series. I don't want to, to give you too much detail, but you see first step, second step, one month later, and uh, uh, we had at least uh, during the management of the patient, I, I, I told you uh, more than one year, uh, 4.2 endoscopies uh, at, at, at uh, mean, uh, and uh, the clinical success was 100% of the cases and technical success 75% of the cases because we didn't pass uh, at the beginning in all the cases, uh, the, the anastomosis. Uh, what are the guidelines uh, from uh, ESG, which are not published? Maybe one could, uh, could give uh, us uh, the, the guidelines of ESG. Uh, so, uh, in case of manilinacy, this, this management was suggested by, by ESG as the best uh, alternative. But in benign disease, uh, they suggest to do that uh, only after failed EURCP. Uh, okay, you, you, you see, this is not what I'm doing. This is a problem with, uh, with uh, guidelines because I am not doing any uh, assisted enteroscopy because it's too long and uh, with a lot of failure. So I do always, in all the cases, in benign, even benign disease, I do this, this, this uh, management with two-step procedure with hepatic osteostomy then integrated treatment of the lesion of intrahepatic bile duct. 
So the, the, of course, because we have uh, uh, no not so much publications, uh, it was a weak recommendation and a low quality uh, of evidence. So it, de it depends, in fact, of the expertise of, of, of your center. What about uh, pancreatic duct? Uh, the same uh, uh, comparison with enteroscopy, uh, but you see the technical success was much higher with uh, uh, EUS uh, approach than with enteroscopy approach, you see. 92% versus 20% of the cases, and nearly the same for clinical success. But of course, we have uh, adverse events, and we have low rate of adverse events with enteroscopy, of course, but we have a, a huge uh, a risk with uh, adverse events. Uh, in such case, I think it's too much, uh, and we, uh, in the guidelines we are producing, the, the mean rate of complication uh, with uh, uh, with uh, 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 US-guided uh, drainage of pancreatic duct uh, is about 15% of the cases, but sometimes it could be very severe, and the training is very important for doing, uh, for doing uh, this kind of management. Uh, so I, I show you the, the result of a, a systematic review, uh, uh, who showed a mean rate of complication about 20% and uh, uh, clinical success in 70% of the cases. Uh, in this paper in 2019, uh, the overall success of integrated drainage EUS guided for of the pancreatic duct was 89% of the cases. And uh, in, uh, in an international multi center retrospective study after failed USCP, which is also an indication, not at anatomy, but failed USCP. Uh, you see the high rate of uh, technical and clinical uh, success, uh, 89, 91% of the cases. But it was, the success was clearly linked to the operator's experience. This is a problem of the training curve. Uh, and uh, uh, adverse events were 20% of the cases, uh, of whom uh, 15 were major. So be trained because you have to face uh, in some, in, in, in uh, about 20% uh, of the cases to, to complication. So I show you uh, a very special case, which was a rendezvous technique after we pull procedures. You see, uh, this is a, a dilated virstung duct inside the remaining uh, uh, pancreatic gland in the body of the pancreas. And you see this is anastomosis uh, of, with, uh, with the stomach. Uh, so it was a, a pancreaticogastric anastomosis. So you see, we have a clear dilation uh, six millimeters, so this is a good. And you see, sometimes it's very difficult to pass through uh, the, the, the pancreatic gland because it's a fibrotic gland. So the, the needle is pushing away the, the, uh, the, the virsum duct and the pancreas. And so now I push the guide wire, but I saw the guide wire going, I, don't, uh, I didn't understand where, but in fact, I, I, I felt it was in the peritoneal cavity, but in fact, it was in the, in the gastric lumen. And in fact, the guide wire, make a repermeabilization of the previous surgical uh, um, uh, anastomosis. And so I decided to dilate uh, and to put a double pigtail stent, one in the EUS uh, guided uh, 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 fistula and one in, through the surgical anastomosis. And we exchange every six months during, uh, uh, during uh, one year and the patient was very well without any more uh, acute pancreatitis. So uh, have we uh, other endoscopic approaches for, for treating a patient with alternate anatomy? Uh, and so this is uh, the, the, the use of us guided gastro-gastrostomy and uh, uh, in some cases, uh, gastro In case of bariatric bypass, of course, this is the edge technique with gastro-gastrostomy and also with afferent loop syndrome. So uh, for... Uh, 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 edge technique uh, 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 in bypass, uh, we have a, a comparison, which is not a prospective comparison, which is a retrospective comparison, but this is the main study uh, comparing uh, three patients treated uh, through uh, gastrogastrostomy for USCP, because of course these patients have a lot of biliary uh, stones or disease compared to enteroscopy assisted USCP. And you see the technical success was much better uh, with gastrogastrostomy and the, the proce procedure was shorter and the hospitalization was also shorter and uh, there, there was similar adverse events. But what you have to know is this, uh, you can have a, a, 
stent dislodgement if you do a one-step procedure. This is the same case and with hepatic gastrostomy, because if you try to pass through uh, the uh, gastrogastrostomy uh, through the stent, uh, the lamp stent, uh, you have a risk of dislodgement of, of this and, and to have a, a, a pneum peritoneum and, and a, a gastric leakage. Uh, so you have usually to wait uh, at least seven days uh, in case of non-emergency uh, uh, indications uh, to pass through the, the, the gastro, gastro, uh, gastroenterostomy. Uh, and in a systematic uh, review, very recent, uh, which is published in endoscopy, uh, the technical success of gastrogastrostomy was very high because it's very easy to do. 99% uh, of the cases, uh, but for subsequent uh, USCP, it was also high. So seven days later, 98% uh, of success. Uh, so I just sh show you how uh, we, you can do that. This is a remnant stomach. Okay, we are with you. This is a gastrojejunal anastomosis of the bypass. You see through the gastric wall the extruded stomach with uh, lumen. So you you push. Uh, you push uh, the, the needle, an anti-gorge needle, you inject more contrast and liquid to be very safe and to, to clearly see the target of the, of the uh, lumen of the excluded stomach. And you push the guide wire and then uh, you, you push over the guide wire, the so otaxios, uh, inside the, the gastric lumen. And then you release the distal flange of the axios tent in the lumen of the excluded stomach, you pull back gently uh, your, your, your lamps, your device, and after you release the proximal flange doing gastro gastrostomy. Okay, the best one, the best uh, is to use the 20 millimeter and not the 15 millimeter, but I, I think actually uh, everyone are 20 millimeter and you see the gastric wall. Uh, and in such a case, uh, if possible, you have to wait seven days uh, if you have not uh, emergency, because if you pass through the USCP after dilation uh, of, the, of the stent, you have a risk of dislodgement of this stent. Okay, so um, I would just want to show you uh, um, another, uh, just, just before I, I show you uh, the guidelines, uh, the SGE guidelines. Uh, and we suggest that the edge can be offered uh, to patients uh, only in expert centers, even if it is not so difficult to, to release uh, gastrogastrostomy. But it is a weak recommendation and low quality of evidence because we have no prospective study and we have no uh, randomized uh, uh, series. So I just want to show you another way to, to access to the biliary jejunal anastomosis. It was the case of uh, patients with Whipple procedures and complete invading of the left uh, uh, hepatic lobe. So uh, uh, it was uh, not possible to do any hepatic gastrostomy approach. And so we decided to do a kind of edge. Uh, I put the G for jejunum. Uh, and, and so we, we, we uh, look to the uh, jejunal loop uh, close to the stomach we are, which were going uh, uh, to the uh, to the bilateral genital somosis. This is a efferent loop, a loop. Okay, so we we push the guide wire inside after injecting some contrast. This is my technique. I do only direct uh, gastro genital somosis, and after I inject contrast, and you see, I'm just delivering the the lamp stent, uh, one flange in the, uh, the distal flange in the jejunum, in the afferent limb, and the proximal flange, of course, in the gastric lumen. Uh, and you see the release of the, of the proximal flange. And I, I, I wait for two weeks in such case because it, it was, I had no emergency. And you see the guide wire in the afferent loop. And then uh, we went back. Uh, uh, with uh, a regular uh, uh, scope uh, to, to see, uh, uh, I don't know where, ah, no, this is the second one. This is the second one. So we went two weeks later. Okay, you see the stomach, you see clearly the distal, uh, the proximal flange of the gastrojejunal anastomosis. We, have, we are using a regular uh, scope with a large operating uh, channel scope to, to be able to work. And you see, we went into the afferent, uh, 
look, okay, uh, just uh, in the direction of the uh, hepatic OGG anastomosis, despite we, we did a, a, a look, but you see the gastrogen anastomosis were very strong uh, two weeks later. And this is the gastrogen anastomosis you see directly. And then uh, after we, we, we treated this, this patient uh, by inserting uh, two, uh, two stents uh, because there was a, a, a liver metastasis just at the level of the island uh, of the liver. The patient uh, underwent previously repair procedure for uh, uh, neuroendocrine adenocarcinoma uh, uh, for in the, uh, with uh, metastatic metastasis in the in the in the liver. Okay, this is the first uh, st uh, plastic stent, and we are going to uh, to add a second plastic stent, uh, making uh, a treatment you see in the left lobe and the right lobe. And of course, you, you can go back uh, three to six months later to exchange the stent uh, according to the follow-up of the uh, oncologic uh, disease. Okay, so you see, we, we can do a lot. Of course, we know that uh, gastrogen anastomosis uh, give a, a lot of very good results. You see with a high rate of technical success and 93, high rate of uh, uh, clinical success, 90%. Even if we have not a complete agreement during, uh, between all the experts about what we have to do, direct technique, uh, assisted technique, using a nasobiary catheter to, to, uh, in, to uh, uh, inject uh, contrast and, and uh, saline inside the jejunal lumen before doing the, the anastomosis. It depends on the experts. We have not an agreement uh, for that. Actually, most of the experts are, are doing a, a direct approach. Uh, and you see the results are, are, are very good. Okay, but of course, again, we, we, we need to have training to do that. And the, my, my, my last uh, slide is about the afferent loop syndrome. You know, you know this is uh, uh, an invasion, uh, neoplastic invasion of the, of the, of the, of the um, uh, efferent limb. And so we, this is the main series we, we have only, you see, with 18 patients. But you, you will see uh, in my uh, uh, movie, uh, it's, it's like a pseudosis. So you can do direct approach uh, 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 without any guide wire, uh, like some are doing uh, for, for gastrogenic anastomosis, actually. And the meantime, it's very short, uh, less than half an hour, with a very good uh, uh, very good, good clinical success, and the, in the ESG guidelines, we recommend the, uh, this uh, management for treating this patient. This, this is a strong recommendation, but of course, low quality evidence. You see only this study. So I, I show you this this, uh, this case. It was the patient who sees the dilatation of the jejunal loop. It was the case patient uh, uh, who underwent uh, surgery for uh, for gastric carcinoma. And he had a complete uh, recurrence at the level of the gastrogenic anastomosis. And you see the uh, uh, afferent uh, uh, limb uh, of, uh, of the genital limb, and you see which is filled with uh, pancreatic juice and bile duct juice. So uh, the way is to uh, push directly the stent, the lamp stent, inside the dilated and filled uh, uh, genital limb. And after you, you release, you do gastrogenic anastomosis, but very easily because uh, the, the, the jejunal limb is fixed to, to, the, to the gastric wall and also is filled with, uh, with uh, uh, juice, pancreatic and biliary juice. So this, is, this case is very easy, uh, 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 not complicated, but gastrogenic anastomosis in a regular case is more complicated because you have to see the lumen of the jejunum that you target it, and you have also to avoid uh, any mobilization of, of the jejunum, which is much more difficult. So now I move to my, my conclusion. Uh, I, I hope to be on time. Uh, uh, EOS BRGN and GDN anatomy could require other hepatic anastomosis or non-direct access with uh, EOS gastro anastomosis or gastro -gastrostomy. Edge techniques, this procedure of better efficacy than anteroscopy, USCP, and less complications than PTBD, uh, but it requires uh, uh, experience and skillness and should be improved for safety. So thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Mark. This is Mohamed Nadi from Egypt. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the excellent presentation as usual. Uh, I'll see if uh, there are any questions from the floor. So, um, Mark, can I ask you about uh, the uh, potential use of EOS biliary drainage as a primary therapy in a certain profile of patients? Uh, I think uh, there should be a change of our way of thinking. We, uh, we, we, should ha we have to, to profile patients where EOS guided biliary drainage could be used from the beginning as a, as a therapy and not only after failure of ERCP. Because okay. there is now acceptance of uh, complementary EOS biliary drainage after failed ERCP. Why there is no uh, acceptance of complementary ERCP after uh, EOS biliary drainage, if, if, if there's any. Yeah, yeah, this is this is a good question, uh, and uh, we discussed a lot about that. Uh, the question is: Have we to do uh, USCP as a first intent or uh, US guided biliary drainage as a first intent? Uh, we have three randomized series, uh, but the series uh, showed all the series the same results between uh, endoscopic uh, USCP approach and uh, AUS approach. So we have the same results. Uh, probably the best results are with malignant indications. So for me, the question doesn't exist with benign indication because as you saw, uh, we have a, a high rate of adverse events. Uh, 15 to 20% of the cases is, 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 is not so, so, so low. So uh, we have to discuss that only about malignant indications. So we have the same results looking to the three randomized series. And so for the choice, uh, it, it depends uh, of the expertise of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the center. Uh, but we have to see, for instance, I think the, 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 the most frequent case is pancreatic adenocarcinoma located in the end of the pancreas uh, with dilated, which, are, which is, of course, non-resectable, uh, uh, which is 90% of the cases. Uh, and so uh, the, these cases have uh, jaundice due to obstruction of, of the bile duct. And the, 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 the easier way to, to proceed is to do choledocodinostomy because this is very easy to do, very, very, very short. Uh, and uh, if the bile duct is, is dilated, you, it's very easy to, to, to use uh, a dedicated uh, uh, EUS uh, uh, dedicated lamps uh, like uh, uh, 10 millimeter or uh, 12 millimeter one. Uh, so uh, you can use your oscope to do the biopsy and the uh, 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 and the investigation of the pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and at the same time, at the end of the procedure, after doing the FNB uh, in the in the adenocarcinoma, you can you can uh, drain the bile duct very efficiently and very shortly uh, with, uh, with exercise. But this uh, has two problems. The first one is you have to have a, a learning curve, but maybe not, not so much than, than for your SCP. Uh, and the second one uh, is the cost, uh, because the uh, lamps cost is uh, very high. I think it's much more uh, uh, expensive than, than uh, doing URCP and uh, uh, putting uh, one or two plastic stents or even uh, a metal stent. It is less expensive biliary metal stent uh, than, than lamp stent. So for me, the question, uh, we have the same results, but we have different complications first, and you need to be trained. And also we, you have to, 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 to look to the uh, rate, uh, cost, efficacy of, of uh, US approach because until now it's expensive. I, I hope that uh, in, in one, two or three years it will be uh, uh, less expensive, but actually it's expensive. Okay. Um, is there any other question? Okay. Uh, we'd like to terminate. Uh, talk, uh, Mark. We'd like to thank you for participating and wish you, uh, to you to stay safe and to see you soon, uh, hopefully in uh, next year in Lebanon. 
Thank you. I hope to see you very soon. And I, I, I talked to Zaz. I'm so sorry not, not for coming uh, and, and to be with you, that I will try to, to, to come uh, before the next uh, meeting uh, in, in, uh, in your country and to see you and to work a little bit with you. Th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it will be um, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Moin Hasheb. Uh, Dr. Moin is uh, there's no enough words. I think uh, Dr. Moin it's really a pride for us and idol for all uh, Arab uh, gastroenterologists. What the, uh, Dr. Moin Hasheb did in the last ten years, and we are really uh, proud of. Uh, you work with tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be here. Mabruk la la zahir, el qaid. Okay. Can we? The mark covered uh, the role of US and uh, US guided drainage in altered anatomy. So I am not going to talk about altered anatomy, but uh, the role of EUS in patients with pancreatic cancer. Uh, all of us see patients who come with pancreatic masses and EUS is really important from staging, diagnosis, uh, treating biliary obstruction, treating gastric outlet obstruction, treating pain. So I'm, show, I'm gonna show you different examples and data on how you can use EUS uh, to treat uh, your patients who present with uh, pancreatic cancer. So first, uh, tissue acquisition. Uh, you know, in, in certain parts of the world, if patients present with pancreatic masses, the, uh, not, not all patients are referred to obtain uh, tissue uh, for, for tissue acquisition. But uh, in our institution, we do that in all patients. And the reason for that, occasionally, uh, you're going to see autoimmune pancreatitis, patients presenting with a mass, neuroendocrine tumors, chronic pancreatitis presenting with an inflammatory mass, lymphoma, and metastasis. So remember that renal cell carcinoma, melanoma, and breast cancer can uh, spread to the pancreas. And uh, for, for tissue acquisition, I really want you to always remember to fan because that makes a big difference. You can see here in this uh, small randomized trial, the first pass, 85% if you fan and 57% if you don't fan. So fanning, which means you are basically using your large wheel and the elevator to uh, sample uh, the mass from multiple sites. And what about the rapid on-site evaluation rows where you have a cytopathology technician in the room? That's expensive, I understand. But then uh, think about it. If you have a negative sample, then patients have to come back. So that's also expensive. And we don't have a cytopathologist coming to the room. It's not a physician. It's a technician who, uh, makes, sure, who makes sure that uh, the sample is adequate. And here, this is an interesting study. The same endoscopist who did endoscopy in two different places, one with rows and one without rows. And you can see the uns unsatisfactory specimen were 20% compared to 9% if you, have, if you don't have uh, versus if you have uh, on-site cytopathologists. What uh, needles should we use? These days, fine needle biopsy, uh, FMB needles are, are the way to go. Uh, these are available here, right, uh, in, the, in, in Lebanon. Um, so you can see here that the suitability for immunohistochemistry, 100%, for FMB, 68% for FNA. And architecture, re retention of architecture, 93% versus 20%. Uh, so clearly with personalized, we're moving towards personalized medicine, uh, we anal analyze uh, genetics data on all these patients. So FMB is the way to go. Uh, these are the best two needles, I think, on the market. One from Boston Scientific and the second one is uh, from uh, Medtronic. Uh, they're really good, and you can see histology in about 90% of patients. So uh, uh, actual tissue 
this histologic tissue in 90% of cases. What about celiac plexus neurolysis? Uh, this is a, this is really a low hanging fruit in your patients who respond to narcotics or are have or are having side effects from narcotics. Uh, so for pancreatic cancer, we use a combination of BP15, local anesthetic, and dehydrated alcohol. Chronic pancreatitis, it's a local anesthetic and steroids, but it's controversial. I don't do it. I don't think uh, it has any value. Uh, but for pancreatic cancer, uh, you know, I use the easy approach, unilateral approach. This is the aorta celiac artery. We just put a needle there and inject alcohol and uh, BP15. Uh, this is a, a meta-analysis, 80% effective. Doesn't mean the pain goes away. Doesn't mean it's pain relief forever. Some patients will require uh, multiple uh, procedures. Uh, here, this is uh, uh, celiac uh, ganglia. Uh, so injection into the celiac ganglia. Some people advocated that, uh, you know, mainly Mike Levy from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the, we see the ganglia. This is how they look kind of high toe echoic structures. Some kind, uh, sometimes it's the chain like this. So when you see this, uh, don't mistake those to lymph nodes, these are ganglia. Uh, but then this study actually showed maybe there is potential harm for that. So, uh, so we, we uh, started doing this and then once this study came out, we stopped uh, injecting into the ganglia. Uh, patients with gastric outlet obstruction. In my center, you know, it's a large pancreatic cancer center. So we see a lot of these patients. And uh, duodenal stenting is effective. Uh, Duodenal stenting versus gastrojejunostomy. There are three trials comparing both with mixed data. Uh, I think duodenal stenting is uh, is the most uh, practiced approach, uh, given the in invasive nature of uh, surgery in these patients with terminal cancer. Uh, in my practice, I do a lot of interventional EOS, and we do a lot of uh, EOS guided gastrojejunostomy. The reason for that is you are creating an anastomosis away from the cancer. So there is no, um, there is no risk of tumor ingrowth into uh, the stent. Uh, so I'm gonna show you one example here. I know. So this is a patient not with pancreatic cancer, but showing you how uh, we do it. This is a dilated stomach. And uh, this patient had duodenal hematoma causing complete gastric outlet obstruction. So we put an EGD scope, we inject dye and methylene blue uh, to flood the small bowel. And then we change the EGD scope uh, to an EOS scope. First, we uh, access the small bowel with a needle to get blue dye. And so that tells us it is the jejunum. And then we go with this hot axis. We use 20 millimeters these days, uh, direct techniques, so no wire. Wire makes you feel good about it, makes you feel safe, but actually it pushes the jejunum away. Uh, so I recommend against it. You see blue dye right away, so you know you're in the right uh, place. Here we compared duodenal stenting to US guided gastro jejunostomy, small study, 82 patients. And look at the difference. The main difference is really recurrent obstruction. So if you put a duodenal stent, patients are going to, if they, they survive beyond three months, there's a high likelihood of them coming back with uh, tissue or malignant tissue ingrowth into the stand causing obstruction. USGJ uh, eliminates uh, that risk. We're currently doing a, uh, an FDA regulated trial of uh, comparing both uh, approaches. Uh, there are several techniques. Uh, I'm just gonna skip through the effort to, to perform USGJ, but I'm gonna skip through that. Double endoscopic bypass. So these are your pancreatic cancer patients who present with gastric outlet obstruction and biliary obstruction. So we can use EUS to, uh, for tissue acquisition and uh, by, uh, double bypass uh, right away. So this is a, uh, again, this is here, I just showed you the GJ, I'm gonna skip through that. This is the uh, axis, one flange and the small bowel the second flange in the stomach, we can inject dye and show the anastomosis. And here you go, looking into the jejunum. And now uh, it is a bile duct drainage. So here, this is an interesting uh, case because you have a, a gastroduodenal artery anterior to the bile duct, couldn't access the bile duct. The intrahepatics were not dilated. So what we did here, we put a stent in the gallbladder. So do you have plan A, plan B, plan, plan C? I know this is uh, extreme if we're not seeing it, seen it before. 
But if you look at the cystic duct, and if you know the cystic duct is patent, so you look at your MRI, you can examine the cystic duct with EUS. And if the cystic duct is patent, then you can drain the biliary system through uh, the uh, gallbladder, but that's our last resort if everything fails. Double endoscopic bypass, which means GJ and biliary drainage during the same session, published a small series, uh, it works very well. EUS, EUS guided biliary drainage. I'm just gonna show you one example. Yesterday uh, showed you the uh, hepatogastrostomy. This is a colidocoid with denostomy. You see a dilated ball duct. A needle, we inject dye, get a cholangiogram, then push a wire. Very important is to do the procedure under EUS guidance, uh, not to try to look at endoscopy because that will uh, kind of uh, and, uh, cause problems. It will, uh, uh, because you're ob viewing, viewing obliquely, so it can misguide you. We only look at endoscopy once we're placing the luminal part of the stent. Uh, we even dilate with a balloon uh, under EOS guidance. We don't look at endoscopy. This is how we did the hepatogastrostomy uh, yesterday. And uh, we dilate just to four millimeters and then we place a 10 millimeter stent. So risk of leakage really is, uh, goes, uh, goes away with that. And these days we have, this is a biliary stent we're putting across the coldocodidinostomy. These days we have the biliary axios, which is a six or eight millimeter in diameter that you can also uh, use. We published a uh, multi-center prospective study on EUS guided uh, drainage. You can see here the success is 90%, but mind you that, so when we ask, should ERCB be done first? Should EUS be done first? You know, even in expert hands, 10% adverse events, uh, there was even one fatal event. So you have to be careful. Uh, you have to be really good at this and have a lot of interventional EUS uh, experience. Uh, U.S. guided biliary drainage versus percutaneous drainage with our interventional radiology colleagues who do really a good job. Um, both are very good, more than 90% uh, success, uh, but the re-intervention rate is much better with, uh, with EUS, we put large metal stents. Uh, you know, interventional radiologists eventually can place uh, metal stents, but they're really guarded about this because they like to have continued access to the biliary system. So they leave uh, percutaneous drains and not internalized frequently, and they end up uh, needing to change these catheters uh, very frequently. Lastly, uh, you know, these patients now, now standard of care for neoadjuvant therapy is uh, stereotactic uh, radiation, along with chemotherapy, we placed fiducials uh, to guide uh, the chemo to, to, gu to guide the high dose radiation so that the tumor can get more uh, radiation and the surrounding tissue, mainly the duodenum, gets less uh, radiation. We have very good uh, fiducial markers these days uh, that, that can go through a 22 gauge needle. That really has made a big difference. Very easy to, to place, again, another low hanging fruit. So to conclude, EOS has an important role in the diagnosis and palliation of patients with advanced uh, pancreatic cancer. As you saw, new devices have pushed the boundaries uh, of uh, US. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mayin. Uh, excellent lecture. Um, is there any questions? The floor. May I ask you, Mayin, about the radioactive fiducial? Uh, because there, there was an interest about radioactive fiducial for our, and then we didn't hear any communication since then. So the like you, the question is how often we use them or is there still any recommendation about using radioactive fiducia? Yeah, yeah. So if you're using stereotactic, I mean, our radiation therapist, uh, oncologist will not do radiation without that. I mean, there is data that it decreases injury to uh, the duodenum, for example. So if you're using uh, high dose radiation, um, that, that's I think the standard of care right now for pancreatic cancer. I meant there was uh, a, a while communications about uh, fiducials with materials that are radioactive. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. Like seeds and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, several studies done yeah. and, and no study went anywhere, you know, basically exactly. failed. Mm, okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, so. Uh, yeah, yes, sir, I yes, think sir. has a.
factors in improving your yield. What about assessing the adequacy or the quality of your FNB uh, specimen? How do you do that? Yeah, a uh, really good question. So how do you assess the uh, adequacy of FNB specimens? So um, you can use rows as well. So we have a cytopathologist who will smear it and make sure it's adequate. Then the rest, they put it in uh, formalin and send it. Uh, that's one. Two, I think we, we need to train ourselves, you know, to, to be able to recognize actual tissue. For example, if you do a liver biopsy, it makes a big difference if you manipulate the tissue yourself and be able to differentiate blood uh, versus real uh, histologic tissue. Uh, so, you know, if you work with your pathologist, they'll be able to help you a lot. But some people have really gotten good at it and they are able to assess adequacy as good as the cytopathologist. There is no data comparing rows to MOS, so microscopic on-site examination. Correct, uh, no, no data yet. Okay. May, may I add a comment? Yes, Mark. Yes, it's Mark Barté. Yes, Mark. Yes, ju just to congratulate Moen, because it was a very nice lecture and very complete. And so uh, when uh, I hope next year we will swim together, we will swim together in the, in the sea, like we, we did two years ago. Yeah, th thanks, Mark. We're going to miss you today on the beach. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you, Mark, for staying with us. Uh, OK, so we'll terminate the session. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zeher Mani for the great work and great effort he did. So I'll ask Dr. Zeher to join us to close the uh, session and the meeting. Uh, I think we, we can take a group photo. Uh, I ask it for a group photo.
Johnson Immunology has been contributing to science and medicine for the past 23 years, providing innovation in molecules, formulations, devices, and even clinical trials designs. On the occasion of the World IBD Day, this year, eight renowned IBD experts from Lebanon came together to share their experience with Janssen Immunology Portfolio and showcase how the available treatments improved their patients' lives. <laughs>